Commissioner, we commenced this second week of the fourth round of hearings with a final case study in relation to agricultural finance involving Rural Bank. Uh, for that case study, uh, our witness will be Alexandra Gartman. Ms Gartman, do you mind uh, standing a moment while I ask you first, uh, would you prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An affirmation, please. Yes, affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I sol solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Ms. Gartman. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Bat. Commissioner, uh, Ms. Gartman, your full name is Alexandra Esme Maria Gartman. Yes. And your business address is the Bendigo Centre, 22 to 42. Bath Lane, Bendigo, Victoria. Yes. And your your position is that you are the Chief Executive Officer and the Managing Director of Rural Bank Limited. Yes. And also Executive Agribusiness, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank Limited. Yes. You received, did you, Ms Gartman, a summons to give evidence before the Commission? I have. And do you have the original summons with you? I do. I tender that, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 4.120 will be the summons to Ms Gartman. Uh, Ms Gartman, you prepared and signed a witness statement in response to the Commission's rubric 4-36. I did. Uh, do you have with you the original statement and its exhibits? I do. Uh, and are, those, uh, is, is, are the contents of that statement true and correct? They are. Attend of the statement and exhibits, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 4.121, the statement and exhibits uh, to the statement of Ms Gartman. Uh, uh, Ms Gartman, for completeness, one formal matter not addressed in your witness statement. Uh, you have a Bachelor of Science degree with honours from the ANU. I do. And you are a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. I am. Nothing further. The Commission, please. Thank you. Ms Orr. Ms Gartman, uh, Rural Bank is a wholly owned subsidiary of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. It is now. And you have been CEO and Managing Director of Rural Bank since late 2015. I have. And from September 2014 to October 2015, you were a non-executive director of Rural Bank. Correct. Now, since October 2015, you've also been a member of the executive committee of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. Yes. And Bendigo and Adelaide Bank first became involved with Rural Bank in December 1998. Is that right? That's correct. And at that time... Bendigo Bank established Rural Bank as a 50-50 joint venture with Elders? Correct. It was called Elders Rural Bank. Uh, and Elders began trading as an authorised deposit-taking institution, Elders Rural Bank, in June 2000? Correct. And in May 2009, Bendigo Bank acquired a controlling interest in Rural Bank? That's correct. And in late 2010, Rural Bank became a wholly owned subsidiary of Bendigo Bank. Yes, that's correct. All right. Now, Bendigo Bank's engagement with rural and agricultural clients is now, you tell us, substantially achieved through Rural Bank. Yes. But Bendigo Bank still has its own small direct agribusiness portfolio. Correct. <laughs> And Rural Bank products and services are currently available through Bendigo branches. They are. Uh, and also through Elders Rural Services outlets. Is that right? They are. And that's under a distribution agreement between Rural Bank and Elders. It is. Uh, now, putting to one side the Rural Bank offices referred to in paragraph 18 of your statement, Rural Bank doesn't have its own branded branches. Correct. We are essentially mobile because we um, work with our customers largely on farm or we utilise the offices of some of our partners. You describe Rural Bank in your statement as a dedicated agribusiness bank. Yes, so we only do lending in the agricultural uh, sphere and that is largely within the farm gate. That's a small amount of lending post farm gate. And what do you see as the main differences between a dedicated agri agribusiness bank and a bank that deals with agribusiness customers as well as other customers? Um, there's a range of um, products that are different. So we have a farm management deposit offset facility, uh, the only one that's available through a bank in Australia post the legislation passing in federal um, parliament. 
Uh, we also uh, lend against stock um, and crops as opposed to just lending against land. And the understanding and knowledge of the agricultural cycles and the impact of commodity prices and other externality such as droughts and disasters um, has a different impact on agricultural production and therefore the businesses that are reliant on that production. And do rural bank employees have particular training or experience in dealing with agribusiness customers? We largely get our, our staff um, having um, come from farm or have undertaken some form of agricultural uh, training as well as then uh, training in the finance and banking sector. And what sort of training or experience do loan origination staff at Rural Bank have in dealing with agribusiness customers? Are we talking about this particular point in time now? No, I'm, to I'm talking about now, yes, yes presently. Yes. So we will look for um, formal qualifications in agriculture um, or finance. And we will, uh, now when we bring on a new staff member, part of our corporate induction, regardless if you are a frontline staff member or um, within uh, the back office, you actually spend some time on farm, understanding uh, farm issues and talking uh, to our customers. Uh, we undertake training in uh, credit assessment, we undertake training in um, hardship, uh, understanding the hardship policy. We certainly have people attending a number of industry conferences and events and connecting with specialist agricultural um, knowledge expertise such as the Australian Farm Institute and various research and development corporations so that we are staying abreast of the latest in both production trends and production practices but also the technologies and some of the emerging opportunities for the industry. And when, when did that start to be the case that your loan origination staff um, uh, moved towards having these sorts of um, uh, levels of training and experience? Well certainly um, Acquiring, ha having staff with a background in agriculture and finance has been, um, I, I think, is, uh, the history of the organisation. So we've pulled people from the agricultural sector um, and trained them up in banking or they've brought them in from banking and trained them up in agriculture. So that's been part of the history um, of the organisation. And more specifically, um, I mean, I can only talk about my time. We've had some very targeted training um, around credit assessment, uh, also around valuations, um, around the hardship policy in the last two and a half years, and I, I'm very aware of those ones. But it, when I look back at, um, for the purposes of this exercise, had a look at the historical um, training, there was a substantial amount of training developed from 2011 onwards and rolled out nationally through both pilot programs and then broader programs. And so we made sure we did that at a national scale. What training or experience do your asset management staff have in dealing with agribusiness customers? So they undertake the same training in credit assessment. Um, so our, our sales staff as well as our credit staff and our asset management staff all undertake our uh, credit training and we have a number of different tiers of credit training. Um, credit 101 and then for more experienced people um, we developed further uh, training modules. We also have undertaken training with our team um, with the National Centre for Farmer Health around um, identifying signs of um, distress and hardship and working with people that are um, under a great deal of pressure because our asset management team, because of the customers that they work with, um, need to be cognisant of the emotional state and how they can uh, appropriately work with those individuals. Do you think that there are particular skills or qualities uh, that are more important for bank staff who deal with agribusiness customers than staff who deal with other customers? Um, well, look, I'm a passionate supporter and, and advocate for agriculture and therefore I would always say yes, that I think agriculture is an industry that does require specialist expertise and an understanding of the industry and an understanding of the, the cyclical nature of the industry and, and how those external events that are beyond control of the farm manager can impact um, production and returns. So I think um, then looking at any of the actions to respond to those production challenges and external challenges requires quite a long workout time. And in consumer banking, you can rely on a POIG and knowing that someone will have more regular income. However, in agriculture, particularly in annual production systems, 
If it hasn't rained this year, we are in a challenging situation for 365 days. So how we then manage things like 90 days out of order um, and how we look at strategies to get back into um, a better performing state does require a longer term lens. And therefore, I think if we have someone coming in without a deep understanding of agriculture, they will be thinking about strategies that are not appropriate for the industry that we are operating in. Do you think the skills or qualities that your staff need in dealing with agribusiness clients differ in the loan origination area to the asset management area? Um, fundamentally, no, um, because the frontline staff are dealing with the customer on a day to day basis and their understanding of credit needs to be strong in order to have the appropriate conversations and their understanding of hardship and working with people in under stress situations also needs to be uh, appropriate. Our asset management team um, are more likely to be dealing with people in distress um, and suffering from hardship, but that doesn't reduce their requirement to truly understand credit um, and, uh, and how they interact with individuals on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. Do you have KPIs at Rural Bank for your loan origination staff? We do, yes. And what are they? So we have them, uh, there's 50% on key result areas and 50% on behaviours. Um, and our key result areas include uh, uh, retention, so uh, retention of customers, customer acquisition, compliance, that uh, also includes um, values and leadership, and then we have a range of behaviours that they have to meet. And they, that's equally weighted across all of those categories. So sorry, I just want to be clear about how many KPIs there are in the key results uh, half of the yeah. KPIs. How many are there? Did you say there was... Uh, so we have um, acquisition, we have um, retention, we have compliance, and account conduct. Account conduct. So that's in terms of annual re annual reviews. What's expected by way of account conduct in connection with annual reviews? Annual reviews need to be less than 2% of the portfolio of that individual banker outside of um, annual reviews that have not been undertaken. So that's four KPIs in the key results uh, portion, is that right? Correct. And you said they were I even. may have missed one. If I, My memory may slightly fail me. Yes, yeah, so four or five. Correct. Potentially yes. equally weighted. Yes, and that makes up 50%. And the other 50% are around uh, values, our demonstrating our values, leadership and um, people elements, their engagement with the uh, branch network through Bendigo, and there may, be another, there may be another one in there as well. And coming back to the key results KPIs, the first of those that you mentioned <coughs> was acquisition. Can you explain what that's referable to? Yes, so there's usually about a 10% um, portfolio increase uh, sort, which might be about four customers. So on an annual basis, the expectation is that uh, loan originators will increase their portfolio by 10%? Correct. Uh, and retention? Sorry, 10% in number, 10% in value, 10% in a combination? It's, well, um, I couldn't tell you the 10%, um, but it's usually about four customers. So, and it, well, and also that depends a little bit <coughs> on uh, where they are located. So some industries will have larger values, whereas if we have somebody working in um, horticulture, there's a, a slightly different scale. So it really depends on the region that they're operating in. Retention is what I was moving yes. to ask you about, Ms Gartman. What does that require? Well, um, I don't like to see any customer leaving us. So I have a very low appetite for lost customers. And does that mean there's a target that needs to be met in relation to retention? It's not a prescribed target, but if there are um, retention issues, then that will raise a conversation. So that's approximately a 10% 
share as well, is that right, of the KPIs? No, I, I actually couldn't tell you the specific percentage there, but I'm happy to come back to you on that. For retention? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, and then the other two that you mentioned were uh, compliance and account conduct. And you've explained account conduct as being referable to annual reviews, is that right? Correct. Uh, and are there incentive programs for your staff connected with uh, satisfying the KPIs? No, since uh, 2002 the Bendigo uh, Bank uh, Group have had no performance or volume based incentives. Um, so that applies to the Rural Bank channel as well. Um, if, uh, if the business performs well collectively then there is a um, all staff share in a bonus pool and that for our sales staff is maximum of 10% of their salary, which largely doesn't go anywhere over $10,000. So there's an incentive for uh, your staff to contribute to the pool from which bonuses of up correct. to 10% of their fixed remuneration can be applied, That's is that correct. right? Yes. But no individual performance no. target. And you said that had been the case since 2002? For the Bendigo Bank and then since full acquisition for Rural Bank. Yes. Now, what about in your asset management branch? Are there KPIs there? No, uh, we do now have some KPI that have been introduced since I've been uh, in place, and they relate to um, the number of post-decision overviews that are undertaken <coughs> and, uh, and their engagement with uh, customers and also with uh, the banking offices. But otherwise, no, um, and there are not strong KPI for asset management because uh, these things take a long time. You'll need to explain better to me what you mean by uh, post-decision overviews mm. undertaken. Yes. So we have had um, uh, a post-decision overview process in place where any decision um, for, uh, it's both for origination as well as annual reviews temporary limits um, will then get reviewed by a higher delegated authority um, and so those decisions within asset management will also um, be overviewed by a higher delegated authority to ensure that everything was undertaken well and if not then there is some uh, coaching undertaken. So the KPIs are connected to the results of those post-decision overviews, is that right? No, they need to undertake a certain number of PDOs. All right, and then the results of those PDOs, post-decision overviews, dictate whether there's some form of action taken uh, with the employee, is Correct. that right? yes. And is there any incentive structure connected no, with asset management? there's not. You've exhibited Rural Bank's asset management policy to your statement. Uh, could I ask you to turn to that? It's Exhibit 2 of your statement, BAB 5014 We have that on the screen now. Could you explain to the Commission when this policy was introduced, Ms Gartman? Uh, this policy was introduced in 2014, I believe. We see a reference, I think, in your statement to October 2017. Uh, that could be the most, so we regularly review this yes. um, almost on an annual cycle. So you have had an asset management policy since 2014 and the one you've exhibited has been in place since October 2017? Correct. And is still in place? Yes. Thank you. Uh, could I ask you to turn to 169 in that document, the second page? And we see at the top of the page that it contains Rural Bank's asset management mission statement, which is to actively engage our customers experiencing financial difficulty with the intention of identifying an acceptable solution and strengthening our long-term relationship, yet being prepared to act decisively where necessary to safeguard customer and shareholder interests. And what I want to ask you about is how Rural Bank balances the two parts of that mission statement, being 
uh, working to identify an acceptable solution and strengthening the long-term relationship with the customer, which seem to sit together, uh, and being prepared to act decisively where necessary, particularly to safeguard shareholder interests. Could you explain how Rural Bank uh, balances those competing objectives? It is as an art as much as, as, as it is in a science, um, particularly in agriculture, given the long-term cycles and the cyclical nature of the agricultural industry. So we uh, will work with customers and I try and identify, once they are, I'll go back a step, once they are identified as coming into asset management unit, um, which has um, been established uh, since uh, 2014, that we will then work with the customer to identify a strategy that will um, help to address some of the financial challenges that they are facing. We, um, on average, are working with, with people in asset management for about three years. Um, so it's not a, there is no quick solution. And often they've come into asset management um, because of external events and it could be um, they've suffered um, health issues or there could have been a death or divorce and if we had an ability to uh, preempt death and divorce there'd be a lot less um, challenges with asset management. Um, when uh, we look at industries that have had large external impacts like the shutdown of a market or long-term drought you know that the solution is not going to be particularly quick because there actually needs to be that annual cycle of rain or commodity uh, production or a change in the market for there to be um, a workout option. And um, our customers and ourselves will always look to try and trade out of challenges. Um, and the challenge where the balancing act comes into place where um, when someone is in asset management and they are uh, what we would call impaired, which is um, a requirement from APRA, we are also um, carrying 150% of our capital against that loan. So it's costing us more um, to work through. And we're also putting a lot more resources and time from a staffing perspective into working with those customers. So we do need to try and balance knowing the agricultural cycle, knowing it takes a number of years to work out, um, particularly in, in longer term drought cycles with making sure that we're not um, misusing depositors and shareholders' funds um, and also making sure that we're not eroding the equity for the individual customer, that we can find a solution so that there is an ability to continue to operate. So what, what I'm particularly interested in, Ms Gartman, is how you do that. So you've um, explained uh, articulately that the, the challenges that are faced in these situations on both sides of this ledger, but how do you encourage your staff to balance those challenges in any particular situation? So there are um, a number of uh, things that we would put in place, so extending terms, changing um, loan arrangements to extend um, and make those pay repayments more manageable. Um, we will restructure, uh, noting that um, restructured facilities under APRA guidelines uh, also mean that you have to uh, carry 150% capital against those. Um, there is an allowance in agriculture that if you restructure for less than 12 months um, that you don't have to carry that extra uh, capital. But really in an agricultural sector, um, less than 12 months just doesn't work because you're actually trying to get through to the next season. Um, so we're balancing the needs from a regulator perspective in terms of the capital that we hold. Um, we will look at, as I said, um, changing terms, um, restructuring. Um, there'll be just some discussion around uh, you know, debt reduction. Often, um, particularly because we lend against perishable uh, products, so that's cattle and crops and sheep, livestock, um, we will look to try and realise some of those to reduce debt. Um, but co always cognizant that you actually need to leave sufficient um, stock available so people can continue to operate a herd. So again, that's a balancing act as to um, w what um, assets you can realise to help to reduce debt to put people in a better position that when, when the season does turn, and you always hope it's going to turn the next year, 
um, that they're better positioned to then continue to trade out. So what guidance do you give your staff about uh, when the balance has shifted towards the need to act decisively? How do you tell them to identify that point when that decisive <coughs> action is required? So that uh, will often come down to how cooperative um, the customer is in working with us and we'll often discuss strategies and agree strategies but they may not actually be actioned. So if we find that the customer is not wanting to actually work with us to address the, the financial um, scenario, then we will need to think about acting more decisively uh, to take firmer action. And what about the situation where a customer is prepared to work with you to the best of their abilities, but they're being defeated by the matters that you've referred to a number of times in your evidence so far? Mm. Uh, what, what happens in that situation? So if we, do, if we get to the situation where, um, despite everybody's best endeavours, um, there is not a, a viable operating uh, entity that can continue to trade out, then we will uh, discuss enforcement action and that will in incorporate, um, if, if they're willing, a mortgagee in possession where they continue to um, have control of the asset uh, until sale. And if the customer is really not particularly happy to collaborate and cooperate in that instance, then we will appoint a receiver manager. And are there uh, guidelines to your staff about when that extreme remedy is used of appointing a receiver? It's something that we discuss on a regular basis. Um, so we have management credit committees where the asset management team report regularly on, on customers and discuss um, what the strategy is, what the situation is, and there will be discussion and some direction at those monthly meetings. And your policy here on the screen is said to be informed by two particular priorities. Under the uh, mission statement we see the priority of providing the customers with every reasonable opportunity to preserve their debt and any underlying <coughs> loan security and the priority of minimising and mitigating uh, both customer and shareholder loss. Now is there anything you'd like to add to the answers you've given already uh, to elaborate on how rural bank um, minimises and mitigates both customer and shareholder loss? Um, I think uh, one thing I will add is that um, we, because we work with customers for a particularly long time, and if I use uh, the Queensland cattle example, um, the longest period of time we worked with a customer was seven and a half years. And to some extent you could say that um, we are working with customers um, for too long at, um, without giving adequate consideration to our shareholder and also um, our deposit base. Um, my response to that is that I think we need to give as much opportunity to trade out as possible and to um, find that positive season uh, in order to truly be an agricultural specialist. Uh, Ms Gutman, are you familiar with the Code of Banking Practice? I am. And is Rural Bank a subscriber to the Code of Banking Practice? Uh, since uh, December last year, we are a subscriber. Since December last year. And how long has the Code of Banking Practice been in operation? Um, I believe that the one that we've subscribed to is the version from 2013. Uh, however, there are prior iterations to that. There have been prior iterations since 1993? That's new to me, um, but I know that there are prior iterations. How long has Bendigo and Adelaide Bank been a subscriber to the Code of Banking Practice? Um, I, for a substantial period of time, um, I think they may have... Actually, I would just be hypothesising as to the date. Perhaps if I could show you a document uh, to assist with that, which is RCD 0006 0006 
what will be brought up in a minute, Ms Gartman, is a list from the ABA website of subscribing banks uh, to the Code of Banking Practice. So we see there uh, an alphabetical list of subscribing banks and the dates of adoption of the Code of Banking Practice. And you see there the reference to the Code of Banking Practice 1993 in the far right column. Yes. Uh, then it was see. revised in 2003, in 2004 and in 2013. Do you see that? I can see that. Uh, now, uh, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, a division of Adelaide Bank Limited as of 1st of December 2008 is listed in this table as having been a subscriber, it appears, since the start. Yes. Uh, and Rural Bank, we see towards the bottom of the page, did not subscribe to any of the earlier iterations and subscribed to the current 2013 iteration on the 11th of December last year. Yes, it states that. Yes, which you'll see from this document shows it, that Rural Bank is the last of the subscribing banks to subscribe to the code. It states that there, yes. So why did Rural Bank take so long to subscribe to the code of banking practice? Um, prior to my appointment, I honestly cannot say why. Um, since my appointment, uh, we committed to signing up to the code and it required some substantial technology uh, investment, which was a project that was initiated when I commenced. And that project uh, took place on the 27th of September, um, no, sorry, 27th of November uh, 2017, at which time we could enable uh, and we adopted the Code of Banking Practice. That was a decision um, that I took to ensure that there weren't too many changes uh, taking place for staff across the business. And so I looked to align uh, the large change programs. <coughs> so the necessary technological investment was made in November 2017? No, it actually commenced in 2015, but the, the project was a multi-year um, project that was then um, finalised and the big technology completed over the weekend of the 27th of November 2017. And what was the nature of the technological investment that you needed to make to be able to subscribe to the code? So we were actually undertaking some migration of uh, banking platforms and uh, we decided that uh, because there would be a number of policy changes across, uh, to, uh, across our sales uh, force and in fact the entire bank, that the policy changes to align with the code of banking practice, which was predominantly guarantees, um, so moving from uh, unlimited guarantees to limited guaranteed as part of the code, um, was all aligned at the same time. Since my appointment, we also um, signed up uh, in advance of the code to the voluntary Queensland um, farm mediation scheme. So that was also undertaken in the last couple of years prior to it becoming a compulsory scheme. So when did you make the decision that Rural Bank should subscribe to the code? Um, well, shortly after I, I came on board. In 2015? It was probably early 2016 by the time I got my head around the business. And you then embarked on this uh, technological project uh, which related to the move from unlimited to limited guarantees or to other matters? No, to other matters. Matters connected with compliance with the code? No, it wasn't re related to the compliance with code. Um, it was largely um, an integration of technology systems post the acquisition of the rural finance portfolio in Victoria. So if it wasn't related to compliance with the code, why not subscribe to the code from early 2016 when you had made that decision? Um, because there were, there were a number of changes taking place in the business and in my view, aligning um, the uh, policy changes to one point in time allowed us to roll out uh, a supportive change program and training uh, across the business rather than doing it iter iteratively um, and potentially uh, achieving change fatigue. 
So that resulted in a period of almost two years after your decision that it was appropriate for the bank to subscribe uh, before the bank did subscribe? Correct. And do you think that's acceptable, Ms Gartman? Uh, we were operating in the intent of the code, so I do think it's acceptable. And if you are operating within the intent of the code, then I'll ask you again why you didn't subscribe to the code in early 2016. Because of the changes that were required to um, some of the policies. So is there a tension there between operating within the intent of the code but still needing to change your policies in order to comply with the code? Sorry, could you ask that again? Well, I'm struggling to understand those two concepts. On the one hand, you say that you were operating within the intent of the code, but on the other hand, you say it was necessary to make policy changes to ensure compliance with the so code. So it did require um, all of our loan contracts um, that had guarantees associated all needed to then uh, be changed, which impacted customers. And so we decided to do those changes in alignment with a number of other changes that were taking place as a result of the technology and platform migration. All right. I so we still we were operating within the intent, um, apart from uh, the guarantee. You had loan contracts that still provided for unlimited guarantees. Up until we signed. Yes, in December last year. Correct. So in that sense, you weren't operating within the intent of the code, which is restricted to limited guarantees? In that one element, but in every other element, I believe that we were operating with, it, with the intent and faith in the code. Would you have changed those loan contracts at some point earlier within that two-year window, Ms Gartman? Um, factoring in uh, the substantial number of initiatives that I was driving through the business, um, I think if we had incorporated those, we may have compromised on some other areas um, of work. So it was a, a decision to uh, sign up and ensure that people understood that, uh, but still apply the principles in every way that we operated. Tender the web page from the ABA website, Commissioner. Uh, list of bankers adopting code of banking practice, RCD, 0006, 0006, 0001, Exhibit 4.122. Uh, one of the obligations in the code of banking practice, Ms Gartman, uh, is that a bank uh, must act fairly and reasonably towards its customers in a consistent and ethical manner. You're familiar with that obligation? I am. And in your view, how should a bank go about ensuring that it complies with that obligation? Um, I think it's uh, appropriate uh, to act in a fair and ethical manner with your customers, disclose information, have the right discussions and um, consider the customer's interests for every decision. So it's about having the right discussions and considering, did you say, the customer's interests in every decision? Yes. Now, uh, last week uh, in the hearings uh, that were conducted in Brisbane, uh, you may have heard the Commissioner suggest that one way to test whether a bank is complying with that obligation in the Code of Banking Practice is to ask the question, what is the right thing to do? Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. And actually, doing the right thing is one of the core values of Rural Bank. And do you think that the obligation to act fairly and reasonably in a consistent <clears throat> and ethical manner <coughs> requires a bank to do something more or something different in relation to agribusiness customers than other customers? Um, no, I think every customer should be treated uh, the same in that respect. Um, the knowledge that you draw upon as to um, interacting with the customer is different. Uh, your evidence so far has made clear that uh, lending to agribusiness customers can present complexities that lending to other customers might not. Uh, and these customers often have a particular connection to the land upon which they are farming. Do you agree with that? There is often a very deep association um, and multiple generations connected to a particular piece of 
of country. And, and there are the external events that you've referred to, climatic events, droughts, floods. There are also regulatory changes. You and agree with that? I do agree with those, and I would also add uh, political decisions. And do you think that those matters, uh, the complexities of lending, uh, the, the long connection to the land, the external events, do you think that those features of lending to agribusiness customers can make it harder to figure out what fairness and reasonableness require for agribusiness customers? No, I, I believe um, that, the, that under being fair and reasonable, um, that is fairly clear regardless of what industry um, or business or individual customer you are dealing with. Um, I believe that the agricultural context um, means that the knowledge base that you're drawing upon and you have to contextualise it uh, in that if someone doesn't have an income this year, that it could be 365 days before they have income next year, whereas someone, uh, your average consumer, um, is likely to, well, they will have a cash flow every fortnight or on their, on their pay cycles, um, and there is, more, there is easier access to uh, regular welfare support as well to underpin um, individuals, individual consumers in distress. So do I take it from that answer that uh, you think that the features of agribusiness lending that we've discussed um, don't make it harder to assess what's fair and reasonable as long as you have the knowledge base as you refer to it? Yes, that is an appropriate summary of my attempt. Uh, and I, I just want to finally on this topic understand, Ms Gartman, uh, what Rural Bank does to ensure uh, that it acts fairly and reasonably towards its customers in a consistent and ethical manner. Um, so firstly, um, having the right uh, staff and having them appropriately trained and skilled and appropriately monitoring and oversight uh, their uh, performance and how they do their role um, is an, a, a first priority um, for us in ensuring that our customers are dealing with people that know the industry and that are acting appropriately. So I see that as a, the highest priority. Are there other priorities, are there other things that you'd like to add that are part of how you ensure that your staff are treating your customers fairly and reasonably? Um, I think that it, that largely, um, and that's not just so our frontline staff as well as every staff member within our um, uh, lending value chain should be considering the customer and their interests uh, and balancing that up with those of shareholders as well in making appropriate considerations and decisions. So it's not just our frontline staff that need to do that, it's everybody within the business and therefore having people within the business, um, even if they're not directly interacting with agricultural customers, need to have an understanding of the agricultural industry. All right. I, I want to turn uh, to asking you some questions about a number of loans taken out with Rural Bank by customers in the Queensland cattle industry, which you've dealt with in your statement. Uh, now, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank made a submission to the Commission on the 15th of December 2017. Are you familiar with that submission? I am, yes. And that submission was made in response to a request from the Commissioner that the bank identify any instances where it had engaged in misconduct or conduct that fell below community standards and expectations over the last 10 years. Correct. Uh, now, uh, if I could take you to that submission, which is RCD 0001 0024 0002. Before we uh, turn to that document, you explain in your statement, Ms Gartman, that in this submission, uh, Bendigo Bank told the Commissioner that it had identified instances during that 10-year period 
where the bank's lending practices may have fallen below community standards on the basis that appropriate inquiries and verifications were not made prior to the approval of the loans. Is that right? Um, which statement was that? that that's your statement and it's paragraph 76 of your statement. Yes, that's correct. Now, uh, within this submission, if we turn to 0021, We see at uh, paragraph 80 there that Bendigo Bank gave two examples of this and one related to a number of loans taken out by customers in the Queensland cattle industry that became non-performing. Yes, I can see that written there. And Bendigo said in this submission uh, that contributing factors to the non-performance of those loans included weak underwriting and over-reliance on security values compounded by the live cattle export ban, falling cattle prices, a prolonged and severe drought, and a fall in property values. Yes, that's what's written there. And that's the position? It is. Thank you. And Bendigo Bank also told the Commissioner uh, in uh, paragraph 93 on page 023, 0023, you see in 93 there that Bendigo Bank told the Commissioner that the conduct in relation to those non-performing loans, these are the cattle industry loans, could be attributed at least in part to aspects of industry credit practices that prioritised asset growth. Yes, that is written there. And that's what Bendigo Bank told the Commissioner? Yes. Uh, and we see that Bendigo Bank recognised that that conduct might reflect elements of industry credit practices that fell short of community standards and expectations. Yes, that's written there. Right, turn to that document, Commissioner. Uh, submission Bendigo uh, Bank, 29 January 18, is it? Is that the date of the submission, I would have thought? Uh, yes, 29 January yeah. 2018, RCD 000 0002 Exhibit 4.123. Commissioner, I do apologise for interrupting our learned friend. I should just record on the transcript, um, of course it was erroneous, but a couple of minutes ago, at transcript 3624, line 31, it was put to the witness that it was paragraph 76 of her statement uh, that recited a certain matter. I think, in fact, it was paragraph 76 of the Bendigo letter that has just been tendered. I apologise. That's correct. The reference to paragraph 76 was a reference to this document. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Uh, now, ben Save me hunting later, Mr Bat. <laughs> Bendigo Bank provided some more information about this conduct that was covered in these paragraphs in a further submission that was provided to the Commission on the 18th of May 2018, is that right? That's correct. And uh, that information again was produced in response to a request for information from the Commission, this time a request for information about the bank's agricultural lending practices in particular. Yes. Now, if we could turn to that uh, letter from the Managing Director of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, dated the 18th of May 2018, RCD 0014001001. This is the letter from the Managing Director uh, to the Commission on the 18th of May 2018. Yes, it is. And we see in paragraph two of that letter that Mr Hurst, the managing director, acknowledged that a number of agribusiness customers had made submissions to the Select Committee on Lending to Primary Production. Sorry, you now won't be able to see that paragraph. Paragraph two is lower down on the page. Yes, we do believe that a small number of customers have made submissions to, or made submissions last year to that Senate Select Committee. Yes. And Mr Hurst accepted that in some of those cases there was conduct on the part of the bank that <coughs> fell below community standards and expectations? Yes, that is written there. 
and that included the expectation of the community that the bank would assist customers when they are in difficulty and take account of individual circumstances, including unforeseen hardship when collecting on money loaned out. That was accepted by Mr Hurst? I believe so in his statement, yes, in his letter. And Rural Bank didn't have a hardship policy until 2014? That is correct. And why not, Ms Gartman? I don't know. Should it have? Um, there are always policies that can be um, in place. My understanding from the investigations I've undertaken is that uh, those that were working in the asset management um, portfolio prior to 2014 were aware of hardship um, considerations, so were acting in good faith. However, there was no policy in place prior to 2014. And I want to understand whether you think there should have been because the current hardship policy appears to be something that you're quite proud of. It's the first exhibit to your statement and you've referred to it more than once in your evidence so far. Do you accept that the bank ought to have had a hardship policy before that time? Yes, I do accept that. Thank you. Now, Mr Hurst, in this uh, submission to the Commissioner, uh, told the Commissioner that Rural Bank's customers <coughs> are primarily family-owned businesses, is that right? They are, yes. And Mr Hurst also told the Commission that in his view the industry as a whole needed to increase its awareness of the impact that mental health, relationship breakdowns and death have on family farming businesses because the presence of those factors was overrepresented in farming businesses that were in financial stress. That is correct. Um, I will just add to the fact that uh, about 98% of farm businesses in Australia are family owned, so it is the vast majority of um, farm businesses. And do you agree with Mr Hurst's views about the need for the industry as a whole to increase its awareness of the impact of mental health relationship breakdowns and death on family farming businesses? Yes, I do believe, believe that is so. Um, there are a number of contributing factors um, to that being geographic isolation, um, lack of services and support across rural, regional and remote Australia. So working on farm, particularly when you have external um, challenges that are outside of your control, does have quite a large impact on mental health. One of the reasons why we now work with the National Centre for Farmer Health and have had training with them for each and every one of our relationship managers. So because it is a, yeah, a substantial issue. What is Rural Bank doing uh, to increase the awareness amongst your staff of those matters? You've referred to one initiative already. Yes, so certainly um, training with all of our frontline staff with the National Centre for Farmer Health um, around uh, mental health awareness and being able to identify um, signs, early warning signs, um, understanding where to refer people, how to access rural financial counsellors. Um, we also uh, have supported the National Centre for Farmer Health to join us at agricultural field days across the country to, uh, to undertake health and wellbeing assessments um, and try and get as many of our customers as possible to be thinking about um, the frequency with which they do an annual health check, both physical and mental, just like they would with servicing their tractors on an annual basis or getting the vet to, to have a look at their livestock. So, the largest and most important asset on farm is actually uh, the health and wellbeing of the individual customer. So therefore we are really prioritising and have a, a long-term partnership with a national provider that focuses on supporting our customers with their awareness but also uh, our own staff. Now, uh, in this submission to the Commissioner, Mr Hurst gave more information about the conduct in relation to the loans to the Queensland cattle farmers. You're familiar with that? I am. And Before we go on with that, Ms Orr, can I go back a moment, Ms Gartman, and the evident issues about uh, health and wellbeing. What role, if any, does continuity of contact uh, with the bank, I'm t talking not frequency but continuity of contact mm. with the bank. Uh, what part does that play mm. in these issues? Uh, particularly when you're going through tough periods um, as a producer, I think it's absolutely vital that 
the person that you've built up a relationship with is the person that you remain uh, working with because uh, if you change, if the relationship management were to change, you have to rebuild trust and the individual needs to have a better understanding or get up to speed on the historical performance and your management capability. And therefore, that puts extra stress and pressure on the customer. Um, during my time working with uh, the Birchop Cropping Group through the Millennium Drought in southwest, uh, southwestern Australia, um, we actually uh, hosted a number of events with multiple banks to support farmers. I, knowing that changing banks during a drought or during challenging financial times is not a good outcome for the customer nor the bank because you're actually rebuilding uh, what should be a trusted relationship. Now, the word trust has been overused a lot lately in terms of banks and their customers, but there is a relationship and a level of understanding and knowledge of the farm, the performance, and particularly, particularly the management capability of the individuals. So, in my view, um, that continuity of relationship, regardless of how frequently you engage, is um, of the utmost importance. And the stronger that relationship, um, it's almost less important about the frequency because um, the, there's a greater level of understanding and an ease of which to interact and you know that you can, um, particularly in remote locations, um, getting onto farm on a regular basis can be challenging and yet when people are in distress, um, face to face is always ideal, um, is always the preferred method of engagement with customers. However. Um, if you're wanting to stay in touch more regularly, phone and, and support via other mediums um, is required. And if the trust and the longer term relationship is there, that is much easier to undertake. So I do place a great deal of emphasis on the long term um, relationship between the banker and the customer. Thank you. Now, I was taking you, Ms Gartman, to the part of this document where Mr Hurst gave more information about the conduct in relation to the loans to the Queensland cattle farmers. If I could ask you to turn to uh, 0008 at paragraph 49. Sorry, I'll get my reference to the document. We understand that it is 0008 within the document. So 0014, 0021, 0001 at 008, is that it? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, no, not 0001, uh, 0008, 0001 being the first page yes. of the document. Yes, I'm sorry. What I want to put to you, which you might be able to answer before the document comes up on the screen, Ms Gartman, is that Mr Hurst said that in addition to over-reliance by the bank on uh, security values and not appropriately assessing loan serviceability, the bank had identified that the loans were inadequately managed, that there'd been a lack of follow-up on excesses, arrears and out-of-order accounts there had been a failure to conduct timely reviews and collect updated farm performance information and there had also been failures in relation to enforcement processes. Yes. Yes. Yes, I see that. Uh, and Mr Hurst said in paragraph 50 that there were also failures in relation to valuations. The bank had not ensured valuations were accurate and independent. It had failed to physically visit and inspect livestock and properties. And in some instances, the security provided included assets where the value was not indicative of the economic returns achievable. Yes, I've read those paragraphs a couple of times now. And 
I've also investigated the 62 loans in the Queensland cattle industry. And I think Mr Hurst has actually been quite harsh um, with his assessment, having now looked at the 62. Um, a number of these were originated between 2003 and 2007, or 2008. And a number of those that were um, had valuations and origination in the 07, 06, 07 years were on a dramatically rising um, property market. And in 2008, coinciding with the lack of capital as a result of GFC, um, the global financial crisis, that property prices fell on average 30% in Queensland, in far north Queensland up to 46%, as a Heron Todd White report from 2014 that highlights that data. So at that time, any loan that was originated um, as a bridging loan in order to buy a new property and you plan to sell your prior property or one of your prior properties, uh, the valuations were dramatically out in 2008 and 9 as a result of that substantial rise in property prices and then that uh, and a decline. So therefore, uh, the valuations, they were not contemporary. Um, and they, the dramatic changes in the property market impacted the appropriateness of those valuations. Um, one issue with valuations in the agricultural sector, you mentioned the economic return um, achievable. Um, valuations are largely undertaken by comparable sales, um, so the market, uh, what the market is willing to pay for. And that doesn't always uh, translate to the production and the return that you can get per beast or per acre in a cropping enterprise. Um, there has been a substantial amount of debate in the valuations field about um, comparable sales versus productive capacity. And valuers um, are reluctant to look at the productive capacity uh, because a lot of that actually comes down to management capability. You might have a great property, but if your management capability is not um, high quality, then you will not get the same returns as someone with stronger management capability. So the comment about the economic returns not being achievable um, based on the market value, I think is a symptom of valuations um, being based on comparable sales as opposed to the productive um, capacity of the land. So that was certainly um, a key external contributor to uh, that, uh, those valuations that were originated, or the loans originated pre-2008, and then their valuation and therefore security held against them um, post-2008. Um, I do point out that um, we did not action any non-monetary defaults as a result of those changed land values. Um, instead, understanding the cycle and looking to work long term because we anticipated that prices would return. Now they haven't returned to the same peak of early 2008 but they certainly have recovered somewhat in far north Queensland. Um, there are also a series of events that um, impacted Queensland um, cattle operators in that uh, cattle prices also declined uh, in 2010. I think they got down to about 300 cents, um, or below actually, um, now sitting at about 500. But, um, we then had a 1011 cyclone Yazi and a substantial impact and flooding, uh, impacting a number of our customers and a number of the 62. And in 2011, on the 8th of June, um, an impact that was not natural, and that was a closure of the live export market. We had 15 customers 100% <coughs> reliant on that market. And Pardon, you had? We had 15 customers that were 100% reliant on the live export market and 281 customers largely reliant on the live export market. And cattle mustering takes place mid-year and so there was no market to sell into in 2011. Therefore, people held on to their cattle and sales were not achieved cash flow did not come in um, to service debt. We were aware of that um, and therefore um, allowed, you know, made changes to repayment terms. What we didn't anticipate, and in hindsight, 
um, what would have been good for us to do as an agricultural specialist is then further stress tested our book to say we've had um, property price changes, we've had political interference in a global market. Um, and what else could go wrong to further challenge our customers that are already um, quite challenged? We did not anticipate a five-year drought commencing in 2012, which continues now into its sixth <coughs> year. So there are extreme external events that impacted the Queensland cattle producers. I've looked at the 62 loans that became non-performing during that time, and they became non you know, uh, categorised them as non-performing because they either um, were downgraded by three or more grades in our credit risk rating, um, or they were unable to meet um, repayments. And I've looked at those 62 uh, to see whether or not uh, we actually should have made different decisions under the previous policies. And there are very few that I don't believe uh, would not be written now. There were nine bridging loans in those 62. And the strategy was to acquire a larger or better property and to sell other assets uh, to address the debt. And that was impossible in the 2009 and through to 2011 and then into the drought. So property sales, the property market became quite depressed and uh, our customers would have been selling at much lower values than um, what they had uh, anticipated. So we agreed to continue to work through. There are probably six of those nine where um, under our current risk appetite, I think we would say um, there were high risk strategies and probably could have had um, more robust discussions with our customers about what if scenarios, what if this strategy does not work out. There are another three of those 62 um, where the serviceability was reliant on off-farm income. One of those uh, does include a customer that um, did not disclose they were in asset management with another financial provider and we became aware of that post-origination. So there are a couple there that um, we would have thought um, more critically about and thought about the mitigating um, strategies to support those customers in executing their strategy. I want to come back to a number of themes of what you've just um, said there, Ms Gartman, but before we move away from this submission from Bendigo Bank, I understood a large part um, of your answer then, particularly the first part, to be directed to the final sentence of paragraph 50. In some instances, the security provided included assets where the value was not indicative of the economic returns achievable, further impacting loan serviceability issues. Is that right? That's right. But do you take issue with Mr. Hurst's, Mr Hurst's assessment in the first part of that paragraph that in addition to that, there was a failure to make appropriate inquiries and verifications of valuations and appraisals, including failures to ensure valuation ac accuracy, independence and integrity, and failures to physically visit and inspect livestock and properties? So certainly the um, verifications of valuations and appraisals, um, I've looked back at the policy from that period of time and believe everything was undertaken as per policy. Um, the area that I do agree is with physically visiting and inspecting livestock. Um, at that time, uh, the elders district banking managers, uh, there were not as many on the ground as should have been. Um, there was. Uh, less investment in the district banking manager um, employee numbers. And so those staff that were um, on the ground were really challenged to get to some remote locations and to physically inspect um, stock numbers on pastoral properties. <coughs> now, there are a number of ways that this takes place and often you will go to a watering point and do an estimated head count. Um, if it's a new to bank, you really do need to do that physical assessment. Um, 
if it's an existing customer, you can have a look at their stock records and get a greater understanding of their trading history um, and therefore the likely stock numbers on hand. But um, I do believe that the physical ins um, visits and inspection of livestock wasn't always carried out um, with enough diligence. Uh, and you've said in relation to the rest of that sentence, as I understood your answer, that what went on was as per policy, that was the phrase you used, but do you accept that whether it was within or outside of policy, there were failures to make appropriate inquiries and verification of valuations and appraisals, including failures to ensure the accuracy, independence and integrity of the valuations? Um, between our credit team and the frontline district banking managers, there was insufficient challenge of those. Of the valuations? Of the, valu uh, the appraisals <coughs> as opposed to the valuations. Yes, internal appraisals. Is appraisals, that what you're referring correct. to? Yes. So the credit team didn't interrogate those internal appraisals in focus. the way they should have? Yes. Okay. Uh, and what about what Mr Hurst says in paragraph 49? Uh, inadequate loan management, evidence of a lack up of follow up of excesses, arrears and out of order accounts, failures to conduct timely reviews or collect updated farm performance information and failures to otherwise detect signs of financial distress at an earlier point in time, as well as failures in relation to enforcement processes. Do you take issue with that characterisation? Um. I do in some respects. Um, there certainly was poor uh, loan management and follow up with individual customers. Um, largely those customers were in distress situations post um, the closure of the live uh, export market and also during the drought period in recent times and following those up and putting pressure on our customers doesn't necessarily add to positive mental health. So part of the, um, part of the poor performance in that area was failure for our district banking managers to inform our credit team of the performance um, of individual farm businesses and their loans. So I do accept that um, the failure in but relation... Just before you move on, uh, because I just want to ask something about that answer. Um, a failure to follow up those matters, excesses, arrears and out of order accounts, is not just relevant to whether or not you put pressure on the customer, is it? These are warning signs of farmers in distress and they're important for that reason, aren't they? And they need to be followed up so that there's a conversation with the farmer about that distress and the way to manage it. You are correct. Um, I think what we have to add here is that these industry-wide issues were very well known. Yes. Um, so we were aware of the impact of those on, on our customers and having a conversation that we, were, we knew of the externalities and the customer knew of the externalities for the sake of having the conversation um, was something that I think individuals applied their judgment to sometimes incorrectly. Um, what it did do was challenge our overall loan portfolio management so that we were appropriately provisioning and impairing um, as per APRA requirements. Now, I interrupted you. You were about to move to another part of this paragraph. So the final um, uh, sentence in or line in 49 and the failure in relation to our enforcement process. Um, Could just pausing there, do you mean the final, this is all one sentence, are you referring to the last two parts of that sentence, the failures to detect signs of financial distress at an earlier point of time and failures in relation to the enforcement process? I am. Thank yes. you. And I do believe that um, we are much better at identifying um, signs of financial distress now um, through our specific portfolio uh, stress testing that we do. And if I can give you an example, um, in the dairy industry, uh, we had stress tested our dairy book in late uh, 2015 and identified a number of customers that were there to be a change in climatic conditions or a change in milk price would come under financial duress. 
and we then went and, and spoke to those individual customers about what they could do um, to better mitigate that risk were it to happen to them. And then in May 2016, with the milk prices um, crashing, we already knew which customers would be impacted. <coughs> so that sort of approach um, is a more recent introduction to the business and allows us to preempt potential externalities on the industry, which we did not do um, back in the 2000s or um, 10 years ago. The, that um, earlier identification can allow some action um, to take place and, and as I, we discussed <coughs> earlier, the sorts of activities that would take place in extending terms, um, changing uh, loan arrangements to suit uh, to mitigate that risk. And in relation to the enforcement process, um, sometimes I think we, we will try and work with a customer for too long. Um, and that's my deep focus on trading out and working through the long-term cycle. Um, and I believe that um, Mr Hurst highlighted here that perhaps the quick and timely decisions around uh, enforcement are sometimes the ones that we are less likely to take. That's what you interpret him as referring to when he refers to failures in your in relation to your enforcement processes. It is yes. Okay. Now, uh, you've made clear that the uh, failures that Mr. Hurst is referring to here, subject to the qualifications that uh, you've given affected 62 loans in total made by Rural Bank to Queensland cattle producers and the majority of those loans were originated between 2003 and 2007. Is that right? Uh, the original origination, yes. yes. Uh, and the loans became non-performing at a later time. They became non-performing from the start of 2008 through to the 31st of December 2017. Yes, correct. Uh, and how did you, or Mr Hurst, or whoever before you identified the 62 loans, how were they identified? So um, we looked at our Queensland cattle um, customers um, and then we looked at those that had been downgraded at a credit risk rating of three or more. Yes. Um, we looked at those that had uh, become a credit risk uh, rating of eight or nine. Um, and um, I think that was one other element that was uh, used in that determination. You referred to them being unable to meet their um, financial obligations before. I'm not sure if that was a separate element or reflective of the I others. I think that's often reflective in the downgrade if they've been unable to make a repayment. Uh, so you identified 62 loans on that basis. Yes. Uh, and before I, um, I want to spend just a little bit of time dealing with these different categories of failures in relation to those 62 loans. But before I do that, I want to do two things. Firstly, I want to tender this document, the 18 May 2018 letter from Mr Hurst. Indigo Adelaide Bank letter to Royal Commission, 18 May 18, RCD 0014 Exhibit 4.124. And the second thing is, I just want to come back to those external events that you've referred to that affected Queensland cattle producers in this period. Uh, you identify in your statement four major categories of events that affected those producers. And if I deal with them chronologically, the first was that in about 2008, there was a major decline in property prices for Queensland cattle properties. Is that right? That's correct. And then that was accompanied by a significant drop in cattle prices. Yes. Uh, and in 2008 to 2009, there was a severe drought across much of Queensland. Yes. And in the summer of 2010 to 11, there was widespread Cyclone Yazi related uh, flooding across yes. parts of Queensland. And then in June 2011, there was the live export ban that we've heard about multiple times in the hearings already. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, and you tell us in your statement that at that time Indonesia represented the largest market for Australian live cattle trade. Correct. And this particularly affected the northern Queensland uh, farming properties because numerous properties in that part of Queensland relied either exclusively or heavily on that market. That's correct. And in many cases, uh, you tell us that affected Queensland cattle producers had no other viable market for their cattle. Correct. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the cattle market, but um, certainly... More and more familiar, Ms Gartman. <laughs> um, certainly the cattle from far north Queensland are not appropriate for the domestic market, so there are major challenges in being able to transport them and then um, have them meet the market requirements. And then during 2013 to 2017 and ongoing, there were severe droughts across most of Queensland. Yes. Uh, and in your statement, you <coughs> describe the cumulative effect of all of those events as almost the perfect storm scenario for Queensland cattle farmers. Correct. And you say that these events, these events occurred in rapid succession uh, and in some cases almost simultaneously. That's correct. Uh, and you also explain, and you've, I think, given this evidence today, that these, uh, this chain of events was almost impossible to predict. Correct. Uh, and you accept that the scale of financial impact was extreme for a very high number of Queensland cattle producers. Correct. Yes. Now, uh, whilst those external factors contributed to the 62 loans becoming non-performing, you accept that the conduct of Rural Bank, uh, which I now want to come to in a bit of detail, also contributed to those loans becoming non-performing? It certainly uh, made them more vulnerable to those externalities. Thank you. All right. Now, um, uh, you uh, uh, categorise uh, the various failings that were referred to in Mr Hurst's communications with the Commission. You categorise them in your statement as involving three interrelated issues. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Uh, and the first set of issues that you identify are associated with the serviceability of the loans. Yes. Uh, and in some cases, we know that loan serviceability wasn't properly established for those loans. It was um, not appropriately challenged by uh, our credit you're team. You're referring to the um, credit team interrogating the information provided by the loan originator. Correct. And, and that resulted in loan serviceability from the bank's perspective not being properly established? It meant that there was insufficient um, financial resilience within the business. So we had assessed serviceability, um, but in many instances it was quite tight. Um, now. The second set of issues that you refer to uh, are associated with security and valuations. And do you accept that in some cases Rural Bank over relied on the security values? I do, yes. And in some cases there was a failure to make appropriate inquiries via your credit department uh, before offering a loan? Correct, along with the um, uh, challenge of physically inspecting livestock yes. to determine actual numbers. Yes. Thank you. So two separate problems there. Yes. Uh, challenging, not challenging the lack of a physical inspection uh, and not uh, verifying uh, the valuation, the credit department down to the internal appraiser. Correct. Okay. And the third set of issues that um, you use to ca categorise these um, failures is management of the loans. Yes. And in some cases, there was inadequate loan management, which exacerbated the loan performance? Uh, it did not exacerbate the loan performance. It meant that at times we were late in identifying uh, when that loan may have become non-performing. Well, uh, the language I used was Mr Hurst's language. He talked about um, uh, inadequate loan management that exacerbated loan performance. You, you would not describe it that way? Oh, it's, I'm challenged to connect the loan management with the loan performance, um, apart from the context of a performing versus non-performing loan. So um, 
the, it's the language I'm challenged with, sorry. You, you would put that differently? I would, yes. And when you refer to issues with the management of the loans, you're referring to the bank being late in identifying... What did you say? Late? Yeah, so that when... Uh, if a loan became non-performing, were we um, timely with that in identifying when that took place because of the uh, cycle of being um, undertaking annual reviews or considering the requests for temporary <coughs> limits uh, and increases? So a lack of timeliness in terms of identifying the non-performing nature Correct. of the loan. Yes. And that's a loan management problem. It is, yes. All right. Now, you also tell us in your statement that, um, in your view, there were a number of causes for these issues, uh, and you deal with this in paragraph 69 of your statement, and the causes that you've identified are poor judgments by rural bank staff in the exercise of their discretions. So that was... Uh, uh, judgment was largely um, by our agents as opposed to direct rural bank staff? Yes, on behalf of the bank though. Yes. So poor judgement uh, uh, in the exercise of their discretions. What discretions did they have that you're mm -hmm. referring to there? So when we're assessing a credit, obviously a, an agricultural credit, I'm sure you're rapidly learning, is not a black and white, um, doesn't fit into a particular box and it will depend on what is the business strategy, where are they in their cycle, is it a younger farmer um, stepping, stepping up? Um, are they in a rapid expansion phase? Are they in a consolidation phase or a wind down phase? So therefore we have um, within the policy, there are um, opportunities to um, utilise discretion to consider the different and unique factors for each and every loan. And that um, will often be, if I use the example of um, off farm income, so the credit assessment largely does not factor in off-farm income when we're looking at our um, debt service ratios. However, a number of farms do have off-farm income from either one member of the farm family um, having uh, a job in the local community or um, that business utilising their expertise, um, their helicopter, their seeding equipment to do contract work for other farmers. And so when you exercise your... Um, discretion, you are then taking account of those other revenue sources to consider in serviceability. Um, Del uh, the judgment piece is also um, in respect to management capability. It's not an easy, um, you don't actually do a formal qualification and have a tick box for management. Um, so understanding the management capability and expertise of the individual and the farm family um, is an important judgment uh, within our credit assessment. So the uh, poor judgments in the exercise of those discretions, um, do I understand from that that uh, the individuals were exempting some of the customers from the bank's requirements because no, of the uniqueness no, of it, their it situation? it was still within policy. Yes. Um, and their judgment as to how likely that income was, um, it wasn't always highly accurate and particularly when we think about off-farm income in the contracting um, sense. If you're in a drought then many of your the farmers' customers that are other farmers are less likely to have the cash to spend on, um, on that uh, off-farm income service. Uh, so the poor judgments, I just want to understand yes. uh, exactly what it is that you say was poor about them. Uh, they uh, failed to give sufficient weight to factors that they should have given weight to. They, they so got they, it wrong. They so were certainly operating within policy. Yes. Um, to under to understand the unique nature for each loan. Yes. Um, they were often very supportive of what the customer identified as some of the mitigating factors. And I believe that from a judgment perspective, they weren't adequately pushing back and, and taking account of the variability um, that might be inherent in the off-farm income or the management capability. I see. So that's the first cause that you refer to, those poor judgments in the exercise of discretion. The second is inadequate management oversight of the exercise of those mm. discretions, which... I think is self-explanatory. People weren't supervising the exercise of those discretions as they ought to have been. That's correct, yes. And the third is inadequacies in staff training. What are you referring to there? 
Well, I don't believe that um, on my investigations, uh, it's very hard to identify what training and development was in place pre-2008. Um, I understand that from 2011, there was a substantial um, increase and in execution of training, which to me indicates that there was insufficient uh, training delivered. And training and development does aid in an individual's judgment and understanding of agriculture and um, and particular business performance. So hence I have identified staff training as a key factor. And you've also identified insufficient performance management of some individuals. Correct. So some individuals were not being taken to task about the way they were conducting themselves and ought to have been. Yes, particularly if there is inadequate oversight then you're not aware of um, the, if it was judgment or you know, poor practice um, and therefore addressing that with the individual staff member. And then you refer to as another cause matters of sales and credit culture. Uh, what are you referring to there? So at the, um, this refers to a number of the issues highlighted uh, in the Willis report. Yes. And certainly having an understanding of the credit um, risks and the risk appetite for the business. Uh, there were cultural challenges between the uh, district banking managers and the credit team. And as a relative newcomer into the industry, I, I'm regularly uh, told that there is always a degree of tension between sales and credit and that you need to have that. Um, but when there is misalignment of understanding of the credit appetite and the credit risk between sales and credit, um, that uh, that actually does uh, influence the appropriate engagement and the operation as a team. So if, if I attempt to put that in uh, simpler terms... You'll do it much better than no, I No, no, no. I, I just want to make sure I understand your answer. There was too much emphasis given to sales rather than the credit risk appetite of the bank. So individuals were selling loans that were too risky? Um, there was... <coughs> no, that's not quite right. Um, I don't believe that the, the credit and the sales force were not aligned around the appropriate um, uh, credit appetite and also the um, required information uh, to inform a credit assessment. But that, that's what I'm just trying to understand, what it, what it actually means to have uh, the salespeople and the credit team not appropriately aligned mm. uh, on these matters. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Well, if I um, talk about the situation now, we're very clear around um, what is the maximum exposure we are comfortable with, with what are the um, target industries, what are the um, common characteristics of a customer that we are... Um, would like to have as part of um, our customer base. And that needs to be shared across both the frontline and the credit uh, teams. And that strategic alignment um, was not present. OK. OK. And was the consequence of that uh, that loans were made to customers um, that ought not to have been made. That's what I'm trying to understand. No, what, I, don't believe, I don't believe so. Having um, particularly reviewed the 62, there are very few um, that, um, I, that we would not still write. Um, but it did create um, challenges in the relationships internally between sales and credit. Um, so that actually meant um, you know, there was uh, not... A, uh, I'm just trying to find the right words. The, the respect between each team was poor and the engagement between each team was poor. Um, but having a look at the loans, particularly the 62, that did not directly impact on the writing of inappropriate credit. I understand. Uh, and you say in your statement that uh, these problems that you've identified didn't um, necessarily of themselves have an impact on customers? Correct. Uh, but you do say in your statement, and you've said here in your evidence today, that they made the loans more susceptible uh, to the cumulative effect of the external stresses that we've discussed. Yes, Is that's that right? Correct. Yes. Uh, and 
when did Rural Bank identify the conduct of its staff that affected these 62 loans and made them more vulnerable? The conduct of the individual staff, well, sorry, I might need to... When did Rural Bank appreciate that this was a problem for these 62 uh, so loans? Well, these 62... Um, if I go back to... Two th from 2009, we identified... Um, from and I've had a look at you know, minutes and reports from 2009 onwards, and it was identified and being discussed uh, within the board credit committee meetings, and they initiated a number of reports to investigate um, the uh, challenged Queensland portfolio. And the 62 loans um, was really only um, following uh, January this year that we did the analysis to identify the specific loans that uh, may have been impacted in the Queensland cattle industry. So the broader issues were detected from 2009 onwards? Correct. But the 62 loans were identified in January of this year? Um, or around January of I this year? I think around May, actually. Around May of this year. Uh, do you mean at the time that Mr Hurst was putting together his response to yes, the Commission's correct. request for information about the bank's agricultural lending yes. practices? Yes. So in response to that letter asking for that information, investigations were conducted that led to the identification of the 62 loans? That's correct. Now, I just want to um, understand if that's correct because my memory was that the 62 loans may have been referred to in the December 2017 response but I, I will check that. Uh, so we, we did, um, because we were aware of the portfolio challenges for Queensland cattle and we had had, um, there were a number of management reports presented to various board committees, um, we were aware of uh, a number of challenged uh, files and that was included in the January um, letter? Yes, I'm sorry, I referred to December, which was the date of the letter. The response to that letter was January 2018, and now that I look at that, I can see that no figure was placed on the number of loans in the January 2018 letter. The first time that figure of 62 loans was identified was in the May 2018 response to the request for further information That's from correct, the Commission. Yes. All right, so it was at that time that the investigations were done that allowed those particular 62 <coughs> loans to be identified. That's correct. Uh, now, um, I, I do want to ask you um, some questions about each of these categories of issues, and I, I think it might be appropriate for you to have a short break before I move to doing that. But could I just deal with um, one other topic first, which is, uh, do you accept that from 2003 onwards, Rural Bank was attempting uh, quite aggressively to expand its Queensland loan portfolio? Uh, no, I don't accept that. Uh, so when we come to look at some documents uh, in relation to the particular issues, I might draw some particular matters to your attention. Uh, but perhaps uh, that is an appropriate point to have a brief break before I move on to some of those topics in more detail. If I come back at what? Ms. Orr, quarter to midday? Or yes, thank you, Commissioner. Quarter to midday. Very well. Just before we move on, um, Ms Gartman, I just want to come back to uh, when the 62 loans were identified. I think your evidence was that um, they were identified in investigations conducted in response to the letter from the Commission uh, that was responded to in May 2018. Correct. And that May 2018 response did not uh, give a number of loans affected. Would you like to see that document to answer that question? The We've May 2018. Yes. So uh, the May 2018 uh, letter no, you, is... You may be right, actually. Yes. Uh, in both the January and the May 2018 letter, 
the references were to a number of loans affected yes. by this. Now, the Commission sent uh, a rubric to right. Rural Bank asking a series of questions about the loans identified in both of those documents, and that led to you producing a statement. Yes. And in that statement, which was finalised on the 20th of June, you identified for the Commission that there were 62 loans affected by these issues. That's correct. Do you accept that? OK. Yes. Thank you. Over the long weekend. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but the discovery of the 62 loans was in May 2018, at the time you were preparing the May 2018 response, but the 62 loans was not identified in that document. No, correct. So well, well before the long allow weekend. Allow me to... Sorry. So... Um, the portfolio performance and the issues in the Queensland cattle industry um, were identified from 2009 onwards through a number of um, reports and portfolio analysis. Yes. And we were aware of a number of um, Queensland cattle loans that yes. in my time within the bank have continued to be uh, managed. Yes. Um, and then when the Commission asked for some specific numbers, then we did the analysis as to specifically which ones. Yes, and I understood that you said that that analysis was done in the time that you were preparing the letter to the Commission from the 18th of May 2018. And I was incorrect. It was in response to the rubric. Right, so yes. when do you now say that you identified the 62 mm -hmm. loans? In response to the rubric, which required a specific number. Okay, That's so around June 2018. Yes. Thank you. Now, I, I said I wanted to ask you some questions about your three categories of issues that affected these loans, and the first category of issues was serviceability. Uh, and now, uh, I want to ask you about when uh, the first uh, wake-up call, if I can call it that, uh, for the bank was about problems with the serviceability of these loans? Um, I believe that uh, some of the reports that were commissioned from um, majority ownership onwards were highlighting concerns with the Queensland portfolio um, and the credit quality and the credit deterioration in the Queensland portfolio. Mm -hmm. And there was a report in... Uh, in uh, September 2009, I believe, in May... Actually, I'm trying to... I might... Um, there were three reports. Yes, I think um, the first report, unless there's a report that is not referred to in your statement, the first you refer to in your statement was a report from KPMG in March correct. 2010. 10. Okay. And that report was... Uh, uh, commissioned as a result of an action item from a board credit committee meeting on the 22nd of December 2009. Is that right? I believe so. Yes. And uh, uh, so firstly, I want to understand why did Rural Bank engage KPMG? Uh, KPMG um, were undertaking our internal audit function. And what did you ask them to do in response to this action item from the Board Credit Committee meeting in December 2009? I believe it was uh, to uh, investigate and have a look at what information was being collected by the Elders District Banking Managers in informing uh, the bank of uh, loan applications um, and uh, what information they were providing for loan management. All right. Could, could I ask you to look at BAB 5022 0001? This is the engagement letter uh, to KPMG. I'm yes. sorry, I, I misled you before. The engagement of KPMG was in March 2010 and the report produced September. in response was September yes. 2010. Yes. So, 18th of March 2010, Rural Bank engages KPMG and we see there on the first page that Rural Bank asked KPMG to undertake a sample testing of existed, existing credit files for a number of district banking managers. That's correct. Now, 
you've mentioned district banking managers a number of times, but could you just explain what the work of a district banking manager is? Yes. So the role of a district banking manager um, in today's terms is essentially a relationship manager and uh, they interact directly with the customer, um, collect information from the customer and enter that into the agribusiness banking system in order for the credit uh, assessment <coughs> to take place. And how many district bank managers did Rural Bank ask KPMG to look into? Um, I don't believe that that was specifically um, outlined in the engagement letter. I, I, I can't answer that question. Well, we understand from the documents provided by Rural Bank that Rural Bank asked KPMG to look into the conduct of five particular district bank managers. Does that sound right to you? Could you point me to where the engagement letter highlights the number, please? Uh, it is um, dealt with in one of the exhibits to your statement uh, rather than the engagement letter, Ms Gartman. Uh, I think the best place to see it is probably the report KPMG report that was I'm produced familiar in with the September report, but 2010. I, I wasn't clear um, what, I don't believe the instruction letters articulated how many district bank managers had to no, be No, but putting the instruction letter to one side, do you know how many um, district banking managers Rural Bank asked KPMG to look into? Uh, I know that they report, so I don't know what was requested, but I know the report that came back um, looked at four um, Four locations and five district banking managers. Four locations across the country, four different states, is that right? Uh, I believe... Uh, three different states? Three different states. Victoria, Queensland and South Australia. Correct. And the conduct of five different district bank managers across those states. Correct. Okay. Uh, now, uh, do you know how those five district banking managers were chosen? No, I do not. Were there known issues with their conduct? I can't answer that. I'm unaware. All right. Have you seen the action item that I referred you to earlier from the December 2009 Board Credit Committee meeting, which I'm happy to show you, uh, which referred to a need to investigate personnel issues and report if the issue is systemic or isolated. I do remember that. And does that suggest to you that these were individuals for whom there were personnel issues and there was a need to work out if the issues connected to these individuals were isolated or systemic? I couldn't answer that without speculation, I'm sorry. So you're unable to tell the Commission how those five district banking managers were chosen? That's correct. Now, uh, KPMG, we see from the engagement letter, uh, was asked to consider a number of matters, and uh, these spread across the first and the second page. So if we could have both of those pages on the screen. You see that there was to be um, the uh, uh, sample testing. Do you see that on the uh, left-hand side? Sample testing of existed existing yes, credit files that. specific to individual district banking managers to consider a number of matters. Correct. And they included the adequacy and quality of information provided by those district banking managers to the credit and lending team, the extent of non-provision of any material information from the initial credit submission, <coughs> the extent to which the district banking managers were monitoring credit approvals and conditions imposed by the credit and lending team, more broadly the adequacy of the district banking managers loan monitoring, any instances of negligence uh, presumably by the district banking managers and any instances of or evidence of omissions dishonesty in the provision of services to rural bank. Yes, I can read those points, yes. So those were all things that KPMG was asked to look into in connection with the individual district banking managers. And you've read the KPMG report? I have, yes. And you know that on each of those fronts, the KPMG report returned a number of very concerning findings? It did return a number of findings, yes. And do you accept that they were very concerning findings, Ms Gartman? They are. Yes. 
Now, you've annexed the KPMG report to your statement as Exhibit 8, BAB 5022 0001 0254. Are we tendering the I'm engagement sorry, I, letter? I will tender the engagement letter. Thank you, Commissioner. KPMG engagement letter 18 March 2010, BAB 5022 0001 Exhibit 4.125. Now, the KPMG report, which is Exhibit 9 to your statement, we see... I'm sorry, Exhibit 8 to your statement. We see it's dated the 27th of September 2010. And we see from 0255, the second page, under the heading Approach, our engagement work was conducted through observation, inquiry and discussions with personnel we see that the engagement was undertaken in a way that included consideration of 10 credit files, including both financial and non-financial information. Yes, correct. And if we bring 0256 onto the screen uh, next to this page, so that you have the two pages side by side, you'll see that those files, the 10 loan files at the top of the page, had combined peak debts of $20.2 million. Yes. And you also see underneath that that KPMG compiled a standard of 16 behaviour checks focusing on the Lending Standards Code of Conduct consistent with the banking industry practice of Code of Conduct for bankers. Yes, I can see that. Now, uh, the observations of KPMG are summarised on this page and we see that in respect of those 10 credit files, KPMG found major themes arising, which were firstly, misrepresentation of data in rural bank system, which went beyond window dressing of credit submission. Reasons for excesses provided by district banking managers in the seasonal and overdraft accounts did not reflect the actual cause of excesses of customer accounts. There were instances of livestock appraisal values appearing to have been inflated to improve the security position of the exposures. There was suppression of information pertinent to the credit. Deteriorating features were not reported to Rural Bank in a timely manner. There was non-compliance with conditions precedent, including confirmation that all tax liabilities were up to date and in order with no arrears or repayment arrangements. There were failures to comply with loan conditions prior to loan drawdown, failures to follow up on loan conditions, and inadequate financial and cash flow analysis was evidence. evident. Major material financial movements should have been probed and documented. Yes. You see these were the findings that KPMG made? Yes, they were. And over the page at 0256, I'm sorry. Uh, I've taken you to 256. I just want to draw your attention to the, the part on the page before, 0255, under the heading Key Findings, because we see um, similar uh, issues in relation to both of those sections, uh, a greater number of issues identified on the right-hand page, incorporating the issues under the heading Key Findings on the left-hand page. Now, um, if we turn to 0257, we see a table prepared by KPMG which summarised the breaches of lending standards that were identified by KPMG. You have that there, Ms Gartman? I do. And we see there the three states at the top of the page where the district banking managers were from. and. Uh, you will know, although it's redacted in this version, um, that there are five district bank managers referred to under those redactions, one from Victoria, next to that one from Queensland, another from Queensland and two from South Australia. Correct. All right. Now, I want to turn to the key breaches of the lending standards that KPMG identified firstly in relation to serviceability. And um, I'd just um, point out um, the behaviour checks, um, I've tried um, and undertaken a number of inquiries to understand where those 16 came from, so 
what particular lending standard um, and code, and we've been unable to identify which document they actually pertain to. Okay, so you're referring to the 16 behaviour checks compiled by KPMG? Correct. Uh, which KPMG tells us focused on the lending standards code of conduct? Correct. Thank you. Now, if we come back to this table and focus firstly on lending uh, standards breaches in relation to serviceability, we see from this table that all five of the district banking managers had suppressed information pertinent to the credit, which I understand to mean that they had not provided relevant information to the credit and lending branch of Rural Bank. That is correct. That's a concerning finding, Ms Gartman? It was a very concerning finding. And all five had misrepresented data into the Rural Bank systems, including data in relation to appraisals and cash flow forecasts? That's correct. Another concerning finding? Yes. Uh, and two had failed to verify information provided by the customer? Yes. Also a serious matter? Yes. All right. Now, um, in an appendix to this KPMG report, uh, <coughs> KPMG provided some information uh, about its analysis of the particular 10 files that it had conducted. Are you familiar with that appendix? I am, yes. All right, could I ask you to turn firstly to 0259? I want to ask you some questions about these uh, file reviews conducted by KPMG uh, in which serviceability issues were identified. So this file that we see at 0259 uh, involved an agribusiness client from Queensland. Yes. And this client had been uh, a customer of Rural Bank since December 2000 and 2003? Yes. And the client had started with a loan of 145500 Do you see that at the top? Exposure at origination? Yes. And ended up with a peak debt of $2.155 million? Yes. This client had submitted an application in November 2007 to purchase an additional property? Yes. And uh, the application for finance was for $2.7 million? Yes. And we see at this page uh, and the following page, it's probably a little difficult to have the two pages on the screen at once, but you have both pages there, Ms Gartman, I see. Yes that the application was initially denied by Rural Bank uh, on the basis that the request was for a speculative purpose, that there was no intended equity contribution from the borrow borrowers, and there were significant questions about whether the borrowers would be able to service the debt. Yes, I believe that's written here. Thank you. That, this was the findings of KPMG about this file. Yes. Yes. All right. And then after that application was denied, the application was resubmitted. And we see at 260 that that happened following support from two elders senior managers. Yes, I can see that. And when the application was resubmitted, the amount of finance sought had been reduced by $1 million. Yes. And that was because that $1 million was to be provided by the borrower's aunt. Yes. And the loan application was then approved by head office <coughs> with the approving officer noting that the previous decline comments remained pertinent but that there had been strong support from the two elders senior managers and the loan had been approved as a special matter in light of the above. Yes. The district banking manager had in fact been made aware before the application was resubmitted that the source of the $1 million contribution was a margin loan, hadn't he? I can see that it was a, it was not uh, 
disclosed at the time of the transaction being approved. Yes, and can you see that the district banking manager was aware of that? I can see that, yes. Thank you. And that the district banking manager didn't disclose that at the time the transaction was approved? Yes. And we see at 0261 in KPMG's observations about this file that KPMG found that the district banking manager had failed to disclose that the $1 million sourced from the customer's aunt was from a margin loan provided by Macquarie and that the loan from the aunt, which was presented as a capital contribution, actually gave rise to liabilities in excess of $1 million by virtue of the margin calls. Yes, I can see that. And KPMG also found that the district banking manager has m had misrepresented the bank's position to the borrower by advising the borrower that Rural Bank required him to source $1 million from another source as a condition of approval. Um, Do you see that in the second paragraph there? I can there? see that that's written there, yes. <coughs> but, and I, I know you keep saying these things were written there, Ms Gartman. I, I just want to understand, you accept that these were the findings of KPMG, who Rural Bank engaged to examine these files? Yes, correct. Thank you. Now, as KPMG put it, the fact that Rural Bank had declined the earlier application for finance and had not approved a lesser amount which would not in turn, I'm sorry, which would in turn require the borrower to fund the shortfall. That was the fact. Sorry, I put that question very awkwardly. I want to ask you if you accept that the fact was that Rural Bank had declined the earlier application um, and had not approved a lesser amount which would in turn require the borrower to fund the shortfall. Um. Sorry, I'm... I... Do, do you see the final sentence in the second paragraph there? The fact was that RBL had declined the deal and had not approved a lesser amount which would in turn require the borrower to fund the shortfall. Yes, thank you. I can see that sentence now. And the district manager, the district banking manager responsible uh, for this file had manipulated and suppressed information uh, from the bank that was relevant to the assessment of serviceability. Yes. So he'd misrepresented the bank's position to the customer. Yes. And in doing that, he'd acted dishonestly uh, both towards the bank and towards <laughs> the customer involved. Having not looked at this particular one in a great deal of detail, um, I am accepting what KPMG have written, yes. And you accept that the findings of KPMG uh, showed that the district banking manager acted dishonestly, both towards the bank and towards the customer? Yes. Uh, so even assuming the bank had at this time robust serviceability policies, uh, this led to a loan being originated in circumstances where Rural Bank lacked material information about whether the debt could be repaid. That's correct. All right. Now, the code of banking practice as it existed at this time, uh, which we, we know Rural Bank was not a subscriber to, but the code of banking practice uh, required subscribing banks to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying credit assessment methods and informing an opinion about the customer's ability to repay it. Are you familiar with that clause? I am familiar with that clause, yes. Um, now, uh, had Rural Bank been a subscriber to the Code of Banking Practice, do you accept that the conduct of this district banking manager would have breached that obligation? Had we been a signatory, um, then yes. And what action did Rural Bank take in response to this district banking manager's conduct? Uh, he, is no, he was no longer with the business. Following the receipt of these findings uh, from KPMG, did Rural Bank communicate to the client that their loan was affected by these breaches of the lending standards? Um, I'm unaware of that. Uh, I believe that these customers uh, did have engagement with our asset management team to work through their situation. 
they had engagement with who, did you say? Asset management team. Your asset management team. But uh, were they told that their loan was affected by these breaches of the lending standards? I'm unable to answer that, but happy to uh, respond later. I haven't, have not inquired of that. Well, I, I understood you to be uh, dealing with this in paragraphs 93 to 95 of your statement, which are BAB 9000002019 and 0020. The, the question that you were asked to address in that part of your statement was whether the bank communicated with any customers in connection with or as a result of the failings identify when the bank did so and what was communicated. And you were also asked, I'm sorry. Uh, you were also asked to identify whether the bank undertook any remediation program in connection with or as a result of the failing. Um, so that, those questions were Commissioner, asked I'm sorry to 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 I did want to arise because as I would understand the question, there is an unstated or, or assumed premise that the loan file, the subject of these questions, is, is within the 62 Queensland loans, which are the subject of Ms Garton's statement. The loan file that Senior Council Assisting is dealing with is established in the papers to be from Queensland, but it has not been exposed that it is one of the files dealt with in Ms Garton's statement. That's correct. It's not one of the 62 loans well, I had that became non-performing. I had understood, Ms Gartman, from your evidence earlier that you said these issues were detected in 2009 and 2010 as a result of investigations and that you had referred to a series of reports yes. as part of that investigation and that the KPMG report was the first of those. Uh, it was for identifying portfolio issues in Queensland um, and then investigations into loans for Queensland cattle farmers became non-performing over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. um, but that did not include this particular customer. So this particular customer, um, we obviously continued to work with and that loan did not become non-performing. So this file is not one of the 62 files that you've referred to in your statement? No, it's not. Uh, and therefore you are unable to tell the Commission whether you communicated with this client about whether their loan was affected by breaches of the lending standards? Well, we would not have communicated in relation to breaches of the lending standards because we were not a signatory to it at the time. But the, the lending standards um, didn't rely entirely for their existence on the code of banking practice, did they? But do you say Rural Bank was exempt from lending standards because it was not a subscriber to the code? Uh, lending stand um, I'm unclear as to what lending standards well you're referring I'm referring to. to the lending standards identified by KPMG in the annexure to your statement that is exhibit 8 so if we go back to that um, and we go to BAB 5022001 we see that the standard of 16 behavior checks was compiled focusing yes. on the lending standards code of conduct consistent with the banking industry practice of code of conduct for bankers. And I have been unable to find what those documents uh, were. Yes, I understand In order to draw that. upon what industry code, because I don't even know if they're Australian. Um, well, can I ask you this, uh, accepting that you don't know where they came from, do you accept that the 16 behaviour checks are appropriate checks for the behaviour of staff of Rural Bank? Yes, I do. All right. And you accept then that they were breached um, by this district banking manager in relation to this customer? The fact that this uh, particular customer did not become non-performing um, indicates to me that the work that we did with this customer um, subsequent to um, identification of the KPMG, KPMG um, findings meant that this customer had no negative impact, yes, there was I, no non-performing. And actually that. the misrepresentation was between um, our agent and Rural Bank. And I, I accept that that is inappropriate. That too, but I'd be grateful if you could address my question, which is whether you accept that the conduct of this district banking manager uh, breached those lending standards? Uh, 
Let's not worry According about the, the consequences. According to the 16 behaviour checks, yes. It did, and you yes. accept that they're appropriate behaviour checks? Yes. And that they were breached? They were. And so then I come back to my question about whether the customer was informed of the breaches of those lending standards. Um, and I cannot answer that question at this point in time. All right. Now, I, I asked you to assume when answering an earlier question about this customer's file that Rural Bank had robust serviceability policies in place at yes. the time. Yes, yes. Uh, and that this occurred despite robust serviceability policies. Did Rural Bank in fact have robust serviceability policies at this time? Um, I've had a look at the credit uh, policy uh, from 2005 onwards and I do believe that it had uh, robust policies in place. Well, by the time uh, Rural Bank had commissioned this KPMG report, it already knew that there might be systemic issues with its serviceability policies and practices, didn't it? I disagree with that statement. All right. Oh, well, do you accept that in 2006, APRA had made a recommendation uh, that should have put Rural Bank on notice of serviceability issues? Uh, there was an APRA prudential review in 2006 that highlighted uh, credit risk assessments. And do you accept that that 2006 review should have put Rural Bank on notice of serviceability issues within Rural Bank? It did highlight some areas to strengthen in terms of serviceability, yes. All right. And APRA made further recommendations in 2009 that again should have put Rural Bank on notice of issues with its approach to assessing serviceability? It did highlight those in 2009 and our response to that APRA Prudential Review also highlighted the work that we had done and the appropriateness of our systems and policies. But APRA highlighted for you that there were problems with your approach to serviceability? Yes, they did and I imagine in 2009 they made that recommendation to a number of financial institutions. Well, that, that might be the case, but I'm only concerned for now with yours, Ms Gartman. Could I show you BAB 5034-0001-0026? This is a letter from APRA uh, to Rural Bank on the 1st of July 2009. Yes. <coughs> and do we see there at 0027? But at this point, just wait till it comes up on the screen for you. Under the heading Policy Exceptions Observation, APRA identified that a high proportion of loan proposals were approved notwithstanding the failure of one or more policy tests. Uh, this is where APRA looked at the um, initial hurdles and not the ability to take into account the unique circumstances mm -hmm. of each individual farm business through the exercising of delegations. But you accept that they were telling Rural Bank at this time that a high proportion of your loan proposals were being approved notwithstanding the failure of your own policy tests? Correct. Uh, and we see that APRA required Rural Bank, lower down on this page, amongst other things, to review the extent of deviation from key credit policy standards, such as LVR, minimum equity and interest cover. That's correct, yes. And we did do that in the follow-up response to and APRA. APRA also <coughs> required that Rural Bank review its system in respect of delegated lending authorities and incorporate the extent to which various delegated lending authority levels or positions can override or deviate from minimum key credit policy standards. That's correct. And at 0028, we see that APRA also raised some serious concerns about the appropriateness of Rural Bank's credit risk grading system. Yes, I can see that on the screen. And I accept that APRA made that recommendation. Yes, thank you. I tender that letter, Commissioner. Letter APRA to Elders Rural Bank, 1 July 2000. That, um, that letter came to us, or that prudential review un was undertaken pre... Uh, just wouldn't mind ma waiting a moment. I think the Commissioner's sorry. just marking that exhibit. 
Letter, APRA to Elders Rural Bank, 1 July 2009, BAB 5034 0001 Exhibit 4.126. Yes, Ms Gartman. Um, so at uh, this time, uh, Rural Bank, oh, sorry, Bendigo Bank had only just acquired majority share in the joint venture uh, with Elders. And so there was a period of time uh, from May 2009 through to uh, the end of 2010 where there were a number of actions um, that had a, a stronger banking focus. Yes. Uh, and having received that letter in July 2009, we see that by February 2010, Rural Bank had marked its response to APRA's requirements and recommendations as complete, uh, with some additional comments being provided in some areas. That's correct. <coughs> but as later became apparent, APRA didn't consider that Rural Bank had effectively actioned all of its recommendations. Do you accept that? Uh, I believe, is that in the 2011 Prudential Review? Yes. yes. So from the recommendations that were being made by APRA, um, Rural Bank should have been on notice from at least 2009, if not 2006, of potential systemic issues with its loan serviceability policies and practices? Uh, I would um, disagree with the comment of systemic. I certainly believe that um, there were areas to strengthen and improve. Why do you not see that as systemic, Ms Gartman? These were about the processes that were being used within Rural Bank and the adequacy or inadequacy of those processes. That's a systemic issue, isn't it? Well, the portfolio performance um, wouldn't uh, suggest that there was a systemic issue. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned with the performance of the portfolio at that stage. Um, you might say that that justified some of the uh, inadequacies that were pointed out by APRA, but APRA was concerned that the processes that you had in place were not adequate to assess the serviceability of customers' loans. They were, yes. Uh, so these are issues that were clear well before the engagement of KPMG uh, to provide that report in March 2010. That's correct. Now, can I turn to some questions about the second set of problems or issues that you've referred to in connection with the 62 loans, which related to security and valuations? And you acknowledge in your statement that um, issues were identified with over-reliance on security values, failures to make appropriate inquiries and verification of valuations and appraisals. Yes. Now, if we go back to the KPMG report uh, at your Exhibit 8 and return to the table at BAB 5022 0001 0254, I'm sorry, the table is at 0257. If we um, consider again these breaches of lending standards identified by KPMG, we <coughs> see that at least one of the issues identified by KPMG in this table expressly related to security and valuations. Three of these district banking managers were found to have engaged in instances of inflating the values of livestock in the appraisal form. Do you see that? I do see that. Uh, and a number of other breaches that were framed in a broader way uh, may also have been related to security and valuations, uh, such as a failure to ensure that loan conditions were met prior to drawdown and non-compliance with loan conditions. Yes, I see those. Now, at least one of the sample credit file reviews undertaken in the KPMG report um, uh, provides an example of uh, the sorts of um, security and valuation issues that were arising. Can I ask you to return again to the appendix to the KPMG report and this time to turn to 0280. Now, this file related to a farmer from Victoria. So we know it is not one of the 62 that you've dealt with in your statement. And this farmer had a livestock mortgage with Rural Bank. Yes. 
Uh, now, perhaps if you could explain what a livestock mortgage is. You did say earlier that at Rural Bank you lend against we do against assets stock. other than uh, property. Yes. Uh, so the value of the stock, we will lend up to 50% against the value of the stock. Thank you. Now, this farmer had been an elder's client since 1994. Yes. And his principal banking was with another bank where he had an $11 million exposure. Yes. And from 2005 to 2008, Rural Bank had advanced various funds to the customer and he struggled to operate within his approved limits. You see that at 0280, various funds approval to purchase fertiliser, provide working capital and regularise account. Yes, correct. Struggled to operate within previously approved limits. Correct. That was also during the millennium drought in yes. Victoria. And in February 2009, the farmer applied to increase an existing facility by $100,000 to $800,000. Yes. And again, we see that that application was declined due to a lack of current financial statements. Yes. And we see also that the account had been out of order 177 days since the last review. Yes. And for 16 days, it had been $110,000 over its limit. Yes. So we see on the following page, 0281, that that's described as evidence of hardcore debt in the overdraft. Yes. Now, just prior to the application being made, the district banking manager had appraised the livestock value for the customer at 1.735 million. Yes. And that figure had been confirmed by RSM. Is that a regional sales manager? Um, I couldn't tell you um, back in those days, I'm sorry. Okay. So despite the fact uh, that the loan facility had not been increased to 800000 in February 2009, in June 2009, a revised temporary limit of $850,000 was approved. Yes. And the $1.735 million valuation was used to approve that increase. Yes. And Rural Bank formed the view that the facility could be increased due to pending sale of the customer's cattle. Yes. And the district banking manager made comments at the time that the sale of the cattle in October 2009 would clear the entirety of the customer's debt to Rural Bank. Yes. And then on the 22nd of July 2009, the RSM conducted a further livestock appraisal. Yes. And at that time, the livestock that had been valued at 1.735 million in February 2009 were revalued at $728,500. Yes. So the upshot of that was that Rural Bank had loaned this customer more than the value of his security. That's correct and that date does coincide with the information I provided earlier around uh, cattle prices. It wasn't just North Queensland. So um, what we see from this is that I want to put to you that the district banking manager responsible for the initial valuation shouldn't have increased the customer's facility in June 2009 in circumstances where that customer had been experiencing significant financial di difficulty in February 2009 and where there were reasons to doubt the correctness of the valuation upon which the increase was based? Uh, potentially so. I'm unable to comment on this one, not understanding uh, whether or not that increase was in order to continue to feed the livestock. I don't know what the conditions were in that region. Uh, at the time in 2009, it was millennium, millennium drought and the last thing we want to do, particularly with livestock, is not advance funds in order to feed livestock. So that, it, that is one of the challenges in lending in agriculture. But this was a borrower who we see from these documents was highly leveraged. He had $11 million in exposures with another bank. Correct, yes. And we see the differences in the valuations 
and I want to understand whether, in your view, this district banking manager exercised the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker when he increased the facility in June 2009. Well, not understanding why he may have in increased the facility if it was truly um, to support the operational costs for his livestock, I'm unable to say. Well, we see that the request to increase the facility from 750 to 850 is described as, an, as a request to cover excesses. Do you see that in the second last paragraph? I do, yes. But does that clarify that for you? It certainly helps. Uh, so I want to ask again uh, whether you think this district banking manager exercised the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker when he increased the facility on that basis in June 2009. I believe his judgment wasn't appropriate. And again, after receiving this report, did Rural Bank take some action in response to this district banking manager's conduct? Uh, yes, I know with this particular banker, um, he was coached um, and oversighted, and his current portfolio is exceptional in terms so he, of he only has, uh, I think, in the last couple of years, there's only been two out of orders for his portfolio. So he remains with Rural Bank? He does. And following receipt of the, these findings from KPMG about this file, did Rural Bank communicate to this client that their loan was affected by breach of the lending standards? I'm sorry, again, because it wasn't one of the Queensland ones, this is not one I uh, investigated and unable to answer at this time. Mm. But this was an exhibit to your statement, the KPMG report. It was, and yes. But you don't know whether there no, was a communication. All right. Um, can I turn to the third set of problems that you've identified as affecting those 62 loans? And if we stay within the KPMG report and go back to the table summarising the breaches of lending standards at uh, 0254 within this document. I'm sorry, I did, it, did that before. 0257 within this document. We again see that many of the breaches of lending standards that were identified by KPMG related to loan management. Yes. All five of the district banking managers failed to report deteriorating features to Rural Bank in a timely manner. Yes. And all five failed to identify major signals of distress. Yes. And three of the five failed to follow up reporting conditions in a timely manner. Yes. Three of the five failed to advise of breaches of loan conditions. Yes. And two of the oh, five... Sorry, I think that's actually only two. I think... Uh, we're looking at the row immediately above code of conduct breaches, personal conduct and honesty. Oh, no. sorry, yes, I was looking further down. So you agree that that was three? Failure to convey loan conditions to customers. Two yeah. customers. There's and one. I'm sorry? There's one there. Uh, I, oh, I understand what the confusion is. That that column relates to two individuals. Do you recall uh, that, Ms Gartman? Yes, but that um, column is vacant in my copy. For breach of loan conditions in the third last uh, row on the page. I'm looking at failure to convey loan conditions to customer. And there's one cross there. Sorry, if you could go down into the bottom part of the page now and the third last row, uh, failure yes. to advise Rural Bank of any breach of loan conditions. Yes. There were three district banking managers um, for that failure. Yes. And two of them failed to follow up excesses and arrears as requested by the bank. Yes. Uh, now, again, can I just uh, take you to one of the um, files that was reviewed by KPMG? If we turn to 0262, <coughs> now, 
This file related to a client that appears to have been a corporation that became a client of Rural Bank in late 2004. Yes. And at this time, Rural Bank advanced about 2.61 million to assist this client with the purchase of a farming property. Yes. And over the next five years, their debt increased to 2.91 million. Yes. And in June 2009, the lending manager requested monthly updates on financial performance given a deterioration in the customer's position. Yes. And those updates were not provided. Yes. And if we turn to 264, we see that uh, according to the observations of KPMG, this is part of the observations box for this file, in about November 2009, the district banking manager had been made aware of the possibility that the customer may go into liquidation or administration. Yes. And a rural bank review was due at that time, but it didn't happen. Yes. And if we go back to 0262, we see that in January 2010, the customer requested an increase in their overdraft from 200,000 to 360,000. Yes. And that would have taken the total exposure to 3.07 million. Yes. And at this time, the customer's facility had expired. Yes. Uh, and at this time, no rural bank review had been undertaken, despite a review being due in November 2009. Yes. So at the time the district banking manager lodged the submission in January 2010, he was aware of the risk of the customer's impending liquidation. Yes. And we see from 0263 that despite this, he didn't draw the bank's attention to this and nor did he accelerate the customer's review. Yes. And the credit and lending section of the bank subsequently wrote to the customer advising that the customer was in default and conveying the necessary action required by the borrowers. Yes. And on the same day, the request for an increase in the overdraft was declined. Yes. Then about five days later, the district banking manager sent credit and lending a file note saying, among other things, that he'd made the customer aware that although he didn't agree with the credit team decision to refuse additional funding, he must now support them and pass on the conditions. Yes. And shortly after that, the customer entered voluntary administration. Yes. And about two months later, rural banks' facilities were repaid via a, a property sale. Yes. And KPMG's observations included that it was unclear why the district banking manager would have supported the customer's submission for additional finance in January 2010 in circumstances where he knew the precarious financial position of the borrower. Yes. And it was also unclear why he would have advised the client that he did not agree with the bank's decision. Sorry, could you repeat that? KPMG said it was also unclear why the manager, the banking manager, would have advised the client that he did not agree with the bank's decision. Yes. And the district banking manager's monitoring of the account was, in the words of KPMG, extremely tardy. Yes. And he didn't undertake his review of the account at the required time, despite the fact that he'd been aware that the customer might go into liquidation or administration. Yes, they were the KPMG observations. And KPMG also said that deteriorating features of the account were not reported to the bank in a timely manner. Yes. And generally, there was limited communication from this banking manager to credit and lending regarding customer issues, despite requests for <coughs> updates. Yes, that's been observed by KPMG. So again, based on these findings, do you accept that this district banking manager um, didn't act fairly and reasonably towards the customer uh, in his failure to properly monitor their loan conditions? I, well, with the benefit of, uh, well, without the benefit of also understanding how close uh, the relationship was between this banker and the customer and how aware he was of the um, of the business's performance and conditions, um, I certainly 
um, recognise and acknowledge that there was poor timeliness in terms of reporting to Rural Bank of the uh, performance and behaviour with his customer. Was it fair to the customer to support an extension of funding in circumstances where the customer was in such a precarious financial situation? Again, um, because I'm unclear as to what that financial um, increase would cover, I'm, I'm, I couldn't make an informed comment on that. Irrespective of what it was going to cover, given the financially precarious position of this client, do you think it was fair uh, to extend in that way? Like I said, without knowing what uh, they were attempting to do to trade out and address uh, the production challenges and how they were planning to, planning to utilise those additional funds, I cannot make an informed... Um, I'd, I'd just purely be speculating, I'm sorry. What action did Rural Bank take in relation to this district banking manager? Uh, they are no longer in the employment of Rural Bank. And since when are they no longer in the employment? I couldn't tell you. Um, with the, this particular... Banker. I know of the two in South Australia, um, one of them is no longer with the organisation and the other one works within the Elders Branch Network but not in agribusiness finance. Now, do you say this is one of the South Australian district banking managers? I believe so. Isn't this a South Australian? If I could this ask you to a... look at uh, page uh, 0258 no. because you have the information that's uh, obscured by the redactions. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you to consider whether this district banking uh, manager was from Queensland? You, you are correct uh, with Queensland and they left in 2009. And I should ask you again, now that you've identified which banking manager this um, file related to, uh, what action Rural Bank took in response to these findings from KPMG? I'm sorry, because it wasn't one of the 62 that I looked at in depth, I couldn't say. You don't know what action was taken? No, I don't. And do you know if the customers were told of the breaches of the lending standards found by KPMG? I'm not aware of what uh, customer communications took place. Now, did the 62 loans to the Queensland cattle farmers that you've identified in your statement include any of the loans that were the subject of the KPMG report? One. Which one was that? <laughs> Perhaps if you could identify... Um, 0265. 0265? Correct. I see. Uh, so uh, the customer dealt with on pages 0265 through to, I'm sorry, yes, I don't think only that one page. page. So a single page 0265 is one of the uh, non-performing 62 loans that you speak of in yes, your statement. Correct. Now, in, in your statement, you acknowledge that about half of those 62 loans involved one of the three issues that you've identified. So either issues with security or valuations, issues with serviceability or issues with loan management. Yes. Is that right? That's correct. And that two of those issues were present in 16% of the loans? Yes. And that all three of those issues were present in 8% of the loans? Yes. Thank you. Now, the sorts of issues that were detected by KPMG in the review of these 10 loan files weren't restricted to these 10 loan files, were they? Um, I couldn't say if they were more broad. Um, these were some individuals in isolated instances and subsequent reports um, investigated things more broadly. Well, subsequent investigations revealed that there were systemic issues with Rural Bank's loan management practices, particularly in the Queensland portfolio. Uh, that was the view of a particular author. Which particular author was that, Ms. That was Gartman? for the credit framework um, report. 
uh, of uh, May 2011. That's Mr Carolis's report? That's correct. Uh, are we going to hear, Ms Gartman, that as well as uh, disagreeing with the description of these events given by Mr Hurst in his explanation to the Commission, uh, you take issue with the findings of Mr Carolis in his internal review conducted in 2011? Well, I'll, I can put some context to Mr Corollis's review in yes. that um, El, uh, Bendigo Bank had acquired 100% of Rural Bank in, and it, that was finalised in December 2010. And uh, we had a distribution agreement with Elders Rural Services yes. to um, provide district banking managers and uh, frontline staff support and there was there were some cultural challenges between rural bank and elders at the time yes. and this report was certainly written to stimulate some action and some focus by Mr Corollas. It was written to stimulate some action and focus, and focus. did you say? Correct. Are you saying the findings of Mr Corollas are not accurate? I think they are overstated. And what enables you to say that Mr Corollis's findings in 2011, <coughs> which extend beyond the 62 loans that you've looked at for your statement, are overstated? Uh, because a number of years down the track now in 2018, reviewing the issues that he highlighted and um, looking at some of the work that we did subsequent uh, around uh, enhanced training and development, some strengthening of process uh, and policy. I don't believe uh, that all that he called out was as dire as it was as the report would paint. But he was there at the time, Ms. Gartman. He was, and you were not. Correct. Uh, and he reviewed the material at the time and made a series of findings. He did which shaped a lot of work done by the bank thereafter. Correct. And Mr Corollas was promoted to Bendigo Bank shortly after that piece of work? Um, I'm not sure how shortly, but he has been uh, employed across the group, yes. Uh, I want to come to the findings that he made, but before I do that, uh, I've been asking you questions about loan management issues, the third of the categories that um, you identified as affecting these loans. That APRA letter from July 2009 that I took you to earlier also contained um, a concern, expression of concern by APRA about loan management, did it not? It did. Uh, we see that from 2009 APRA was raising concerns about whether early warning signs of credit deterioration were being adequately realised through rural banks' credit processes. Yes. Uh, and APRA said that it had obtained a sense from its reviews that rural banks' willingness to increase a borrower's debt may at times be as a result of the bank's reluctance to more prudently enforce its credit program. Do you recall that finding or that statement by APRA? Yes. Thank you. And we see from the board credit committee meeting minutes that you've annexed to your statement that between February 2009 and January 2010, Rural Bank had downgraded 194 clients by three or more grades on its nine grade credit risk rating system. Correct, yes. Now, uh, six months before the KPMG report was delivered, uh, in March 2010, the Board Credit Committee had expressed concerns that there'd been no improvement in dealing with accounts in arrears and account management in the early stages of delinquency remained a major issue. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Uh, and one manifestation of that, as noted in the Board Credit Committee minutes, was that credit and lending personnel in Queensland were undertaking what's described in the document as increased AMU tasks. Does AMU in that context mean asset management unit? I believe it does. So by that time there were clear indicators that there were a significant number of loans in need of active account management, particularly in Queensland? Correct. Um, 
largely resulting from a number of the conditions that we've discussed earlier. And do you accept that those minutes record that despite this, Rural Bank was continuing to give priority, at least in Queensland, to new business and additional lending to existing clients over no increase annual reviews? Um, in terms of the priority of time allocated? Is that what you're asking? Well, perhaps if I show you that entry from the minutes and you can comment on it, Ms Gartman, it's your Exhibit 7, BAB 5022-0004-0001. So you see these are minutes of a Board Credit Committee meeting on the 16th of March 2010. Yes. And if we turn to uh, triple zero... Triple zero two within that document. Sorry, I'm just finding the document in my materials, Ms. Gartman. At triple zero two, we see the reference there. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the right part to direct you to, Ms Gartman. 5022 You have it. My junior has it. I can't find it in my materials, so I'm going to use Mr Lesnikov's. Thank you. Uh, now... Under Queensland, bullet point Thank two. You. Thank you, Commissioner. Do you see there I had already taken you to credit and lending personnel are undertaking increased AMU tasks? Yes. Priority is being given to new business and additional lending to existing clients over no increased annual reviews. Yes, how, I can see that. And how do you interpret that? Well, I interpret it that um, where there is um, uh, an annual review required where it's maintenance as opposed to working with existing customers that require additional lending um, to support their operations. And that could, again, I can't tell you whether or not it was for additional um, term lending or additional lending to support cattle operations um, or otherwise, um, then yes, the priority would have been to support people uh, that were requiring assistance to work through. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm struggling to understand how you read that into the words priority is being given to new business and additional lending to existing clients over no increase annual reviews. I'm not disputing that. I'm putting some context as to supporting customers that um, may be requiring, I'm looking at the additional lending component. Well, what, what about new business? Why would priority, given everything that we've discussed about what was going on in this period for Queensland cattle farmers in particular, why would priority be given to new business? Because um, we have equal uh, weighting across compliance and annual reviews, customer retention and also new acquisitions. Because the KPIs required people to yes. sell more loans? As part of their yes. KPI as well as, uh, because if um, new business is important for any corporate operation. But why would you give priority over these problems that we've been discussing? So we, we can see that you've got increased personnel undertaking AMU tasks, asset management tasks. Was that an appropriate time to prioritise generating new business? It was not an appropriate time. And we see that Mr Ormsby, uh, who's referred to in the final dot point there, who was one of Rural Bank's directors, noted in relation to Queensland that unfavourable cycles have emerged over the years and whilst the issues need to be dealt with, the bank must also continue to focus on opportunities presented by these cycles. What opportunities do unfavourable cycles <coughs> present, Ms Gartman? I'm sorry, not being at the meeting, I'm not sh I could not say what Mr Ormsby well, meant. Reading apart that, from reading what it. do you interpret him to be referring to there? Um, I couldn't. I couldn't say. Well, what do you say are the opportunities that emerge from unfavourable cycles for the bank? Um, only to work through with customers. 
you think that's what Mr Ormsby is referring to there? I could speculate what he's inferring, but I won't. And why is that? I don't think it's appropriate for me to pretend I'm Mr Ormsby. I'm sorry. No, I'm asking about your interpretation of that sentence there. So I would imagine um, that he's talking about working through with customers through an unfavourable cycle. I see. All right. So even after the KPMG report was delivered in September 2010, it took Rural Bank some time to recognise that it had systemic loan management issues, didn't it? It took some time to identify that we needed to improve our oversight and therefore application. And that you had of sy our loan management. systemic loan management issues. I don't believe that we had systemic loan management issues. And is that because you disagree with Mr. Carolus and the findings of his report in 2011? I do. I disagree with a number of um, the severity with which he painted uh, the picture. Rural Bank at this time appears from a number of the documents that have been provided to the Commission to have put the marked increase in its level of impaired assets down to the adverse seasonal conditions. Do you agree with that? They were exceptional con contributing factors, yes. And uh, there was further engagement with APRA in 2011. Do you recall those documents? Um, I have seen them. Could I show you BAB 5024 0001 You see, this is a letter from APRA to Rural Bank on the 7th of January 2011. Yes. And at 1709, we see APRA commenting on the increase in Rural Bank's impaired assets. Yes. And APRA observed that there'd been a marked increase in the bank's level of impaired assets over a quite short period of time. Yes. And APRA noted that there were several drivers behind specific cases of impairment and downgrades of credit risk ratings, but the key driver appeared to be adverse seasonal conditions. Yes. And APRA required Rural Bank uh, to provide various reports about its impaired assets. Yes. And we see from 1710, that APRA was provided with the KPMG report? Yes. And APRA noted that the KPMG report contained some concerning issues for the bank and requested a copy of any response received from elders in response to those matters. Yes. I tender that letter, Commissioner. Letter APRA to Rural Bank Limited dated, Ms Orr? Uh, dated 7, 7 January 2011. <coughs> 7 January 11, uh, BAB 5024-0001-1708, Exhibit uh, 4.127. Is that a point at which uh, to... Just before we yeah. break, if you wouldn't mind, Commissioner. No, of course not. Uh, following receipt of that report, in February 2011, Rural Bank started querying whether it might have systemic issues in respect of loan management. Do you agree with that? Uh, through the Tasso uh, Corollis report? Mr yes. Corollis's report. So by, by this time, a further 156 customers had been downgraded by three or more credit grades in the previous year. Yes. Uh, and there was then a meeting of the Board Credit Committee on the 2nd of February 2011 that was the genesis of Mr Corollis's work. Yes. I'll, I'll come to that meeting after the break, if the Commission pleases. Yes. 2pm. <laughs> yes, Ms. Earl. Ms. Gartman, before the break, I had asked you some questions about February 2011, uh, when Rural Bank was starting to query whether it had systemic issues in relation to loan management. Uh, could I ask you to look at Exhibit 7 to your statement, BAB 5022 0004 0005? 
These are minutes of a board credit committee meeting on the 2nd of February 2011. <coughs> and do we see there at the bottom of the page, do you have that there, Ms Gartman? I have on the screen, yes. At the bottom of the page, we see some things that were highlighted by the GM for risk. We see higher up the page that the GM for risk, the general manager for risk, was Mr Carollas. Yes. And Mr Carollas highlighted to this meeting of the Board Credit Committee on the 2nd of February 2011 that there was a continuing trend of downgrades in the Queensland portfolio within recent downgrades concentrated in one portfolio. The bank remains outside its target range for the CRR distribution of the portfolio and in the absence of new growth, this is unlikely to be addressed in the short term, particularly given the prevailing conditions in the Queensland property market. And the majority of asset management unit resources are being devoted to the Queensland portfolio and further resource allocations are underway. Yes. That was highlighted by the General Manager of Risk to the Board Credit Committee on this date. Yes. And we then see over the page that as a result of those matters being highlighted, the committee discussed in some detail at the top of the page the key points highlighted in the executive summary and the current state of the portfolio which is outside the Board Credit Committee's target credit quality parameters. Yes. The chairman then had some things to say about that. The chairman expressed his disappointment with the findings in the APRA review report, which I had taken you to earlier. The chairman queried whether the issues were isolated to a small number of loans or whether the issues were more systemic and also queried whether the general manager of risk has sufficient resources to allocate to resolving these issues. The chairman also noted that a proportionately large percentage of larger loans have proven to be problematic. These items were discussed by the committee and the chairman requested that the general manager for risk provide the committee at its next meeting with the following. A paper outlining the key issues and what processes are being adopted to identify, rectify and address deteriorating, distressed and impaired assets, including resource requirements. And you see that that paper was also to address whether there are any systemic issues that need to be addressed and recommendations in this regard. Yes. So that was what the chairman sought at this meeting on the 2nd of February 2011. Yes. And the systemic nature of the loan monitoring problem became fully apparent to Rural Bank throughout 2011. I still disagree that it was a systemic problem. Um, I think before the break you mentioned 159 um, accounts had been downgraded. 156 in the year prior to this. Out of 8,000 customers, I don't believe that that's a systemic issue. Well, that's about the number, that's about the volume of uh, files downgraded um, that's a slightly different matter, isn't it, to whether these are systemic or isolated issues that are resulting in the bank remaining outside its target range for the CRR distribution of the portfolio? Well, when we take into account the millennium drought that broke in early 2011 and what had happened in Queensland cattle, um, conditions in Australian agric agriculture were challenged. Um, and yes, our credit quality had deteriorated. Um, however, they were in particular regions that were impacted by multiple events. And how many clients did you say that Rural Bank had at this time, Ms Gartman? Um, in, what year was this? 2011. 2011, I think we had about 5,000 Thank customers. you. Now, uh, this is the meeting, this is the discussion at the meeting on the 2nd of February 2011. There's a further uh, discussion of these matters at a meeting on the 18th of May 2011. Have you yes. seen the minutes from that meeting, Ms Gartman? I have. And that's your, it's part of your Exhibit 11, BAB 5025 0001 
And if we turn to 0166 within that document, we see that uh, Mr Wilkinson, the Head of Asset <coughs> Management, uh, advised that the majority of credit downgrades related to accounts which had not been reviewed for up to two years and now reflected a deteriorated position that had not been brought to the bank's attention. Do you Great. see that? Yes, I can see that. So was it acceptable for accounts to have not been reviewed for up to two years? Uh, excluding uh, the term loans uh, that only are only required to be reviewed every three years, then no, it's not. So the uh, loans should have been reviewed more regularly? An annual review is required. Thank you. And we see that um, Mr Wilkins said that uh, the credit downgrades related to accounts which had not been reviewed for up to two years and now reflected a deteriorated position that had not been brought to the bank's attention. So who should have brought that deteriorated position to the bank's attention? Uh, the district banking managers. And they were not doing that? Uh, I'm assuming from the set of minutes that they were not. So there was a systemic failure to properly monitor accounts. Certainly in the Queensland portfolio that I've looked at closely, um, there were delays across the portfolio in reporting. And that failure to properly monitor accounts isn't surprising, I want to put to you, given that the bank had made a commercial decision in March 2010 to give priority to new business and additional lending to existing clients. It was, uh, there's still a balance between account retention and uh, the annual review process and compliance and new acquisitions, yes. The balance wasn't working, was it, Ms Gartman? You had matters where loans hadn't been reviewed for up to two years, and I'm putting to you that that poor loan management was a consequence of a commercial decision that had been made to prioritise new lending. I think it was also influenced by um, lack of on-ground resources uh, through our district banking manager network. Um, there, had, there were a low number on the ground at that time. So and also because uh, we did have uh, in that 2011 period customers that were under stress and not always can we meet face to face to do those annual reviews. So yes, there was um, poor focus from our staff on the ground. There were some reluctant customers to engage uh, in looking and quantifying their position. Um, and we didn't have enough people on the ground to do that. So do you accept that that poor focus from the people you did have on the ground, as you've described it, um, was a result of the decision by the bank, the commercial decision by the bank, to ask them to prioritise new lending over the management of existing clients? I think we always have to have some focus <coughs> on growth. And the balance is, and the lack of oversight and management of the frontline staff was that they were not putting sufficient focus on their annual review process. That's not to say it was not undertaken altogether. Yes, but you appear to want to um, answer my questions by reference to the conduct of those on the ground staff. What I'm trying to ask you to engage with is the directive from above to them to prioritise on new lending, prioritise new lending rather than the management of existing clients. Um, the minutes that you showed me where that was, it was a reflection of a conversation rather than a directive. And so I can't say that it was actually a directive. Right, but that was the position of the board credit committee in that meeting uh, to, from to those make that prioritisation. I think the point, uh, bullet point was actually highlighting that there appeared to be a focus on those above, a well, prioritisation above annual reviews. Perhaps if I can take you uh, to some other documents that um, speak of the focus on growth in the Queensland portfolio in this period. 
can we go to Mr Carolus's report, which was produced in response to the request from the chairman uh, in the meeting in May, I'm sorry, in February 2011 that I took you to. Mr Carolus's report is Exhibit 9 to your statement, BAB 5022-0001-0009. So this is the report produced by the General Manager of Risk following uh, that meeting. Yes. And it was produced for another meeting of the Board Credit Committee in July 2011. Yes. And I want to put to you at the outset that this report, which you've annexed to your statement and which you refer to in your statement as the credit structure report, put the existence of a systemic problem in respect of loan monitoring and indeed loan origination beyond doubt. With the benefit of hindsight, I disagree because much of what Mr Carollis um, suggested would happen did not happen to the portfolio. Well, I, I want to focus on what he said was happening in the portfolio. Um, now, perhaps the best thing to do is to take you to some particular um, findings made by Mr Carollis in this report. Uh, can we uh, start by looking at the first page, 0009? And what I want to suggest to you is that um, under the heading discussion, uh, Mr Carollis gives a somewhat sobering overview of the state of R Rural Bank's loan portfolio. Do you see the references to the deterioration in the credit quality of the portfolio? I can see that. And do you see underneath the dot points his reference to the level and amount of problem loans being too high and outside tolerance in absolute, absolute terms? I can see that, yes. And if we turn to 0010, we see in the first paragraph below the dot points that Mr Carollis observed that since April 2010, credit quality had continued to deteriorate across the rural and AMIS, AMIS? Uh, that was a managed investment scheme yes. loan program. Yes, loan portfolios at a rate higher than expected. The discussion below focuses on the rural portfolio unless otherwise stated. Yes. Now, we see that underneath that, in relation to rural lending, Mr Carolla stated that the majority of the deterioration has occurred in Queensland. The deterioration in the credit profile of the Queensland portfolio has been exacerbated by the depressed property market, which shows little sign of improvement. It is important to highlight that the Queensland property market has contributed <coughs> to the level, the current level of problem accounts but in the main has not been a causal factor leading to defaults. The property market has, however, exacerbated losses and led to contracted and prolonged workout periods. Do you agree with that, Ms Gartman? Um, I disagree with Mr Carollis's causal factor. Why is that? Uh, again, with the benefit of hindsight and looking at the portfolio as a whole and understanding agriculture, no disrespect to Mr Carollis, but understanding agricultural volatility, um, I disagree with his comment there. So Mr Carollis was tasked by the chairman of the board credit committee uh, to undertake this work. He was engaged to do that work in 2011 at the time of the deterioration of the portfolio. Yes. But you say you're in a better position in uh, June 2018 to assess what was going on with the loan portfolio in Queensland? Uh, certainly I'm not in the moment and I'm taking a more objective view of the longer term agricultural cycle. Why don't you think Mr Carollis was taking an objective view? Um, because at the time we had, uh, I believe that the business was only recently uh, fully 100% owned, as yes. I've highlighted earlier. Yes. There were some um, challenges in the uh, cultural alignment between uh, elders and rural bank. Yes. Um, and certainly there had been uh, a marked impact on the portfolio in Queensland. But why do those matters about the um, relationship between um, 
uh, the two entities in this period of acquisition affect the accuracy of the findings and observations made by Mr Carolus in this document? Um, because this was um, a report also written to try and stimulate, as I said before the break, um, some greater focus and investment in the district manager, banking manager resources and their performance. Why, why do you say that, um, Ms Gartman? This was a report that was responsive to a request from the chairman for a paper outlining the key issues and processes that are being adopted to identify, rectify and address deteriorating, distressed and impaired assets and address whether there are any systemic issues that need to be addressed. Because from my investigations um, and review from material at the time, there were a number of cultural misalignment challenges between the two organisations. I understand that. And this report was to bring greater focus and attention to the credit quality of the portfolio and the investment in resources to undertake that. But this wasn't a report directed to understanding cultural misalignment challenges. It was directed to answering the chairman's request to analyse whether there were systemic issues that needed to be addressed and recommendations made. Correct. All right. Well, let, let's look at page 0012 uh, because we can see from uh, that page underneath the first graph this, the last sentence in that paragraph that Mr Carolus recognised that the rate of growth in Queensland was much higher than every other state and well above national growth rates. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Mm -hmm. If you look at the industry growth rates for Queensland agricultural lending at the time, you would also see that it was well above national growth rates. Mm -hmm. So we were tracking in line with the industry which was investing on the back of the rising property market. We see at 0013 that Mr Carolus observed at the top of the page that the proportion of the Queensland portfolio in loans of more than $10 million had increased quite rapidly, moving from approximately 6% in 2004 to over 22% by 2009. You accept that those statistics are correct? That is correct, and it also reflects the um, background paper that was released uh, from the department highlighting the growth in agricultural debt, particularly in Queensland at that time. Well, we see from 0014 that Mr Carolus... Before we leave that, we see from the next sentence in 013 that the concentration, in fact, was well in excess of national average, don't we? Uh, the distribution of large loans, so yeah. national average for the rural bank portfolio, yes. And the, the Queensland portfolio um, and Queensland loans more broadly across the agricultural um, sector were substantially um, large compared to the rest of Australia. We see from 0014 Mr Carolus's analysis of this growth in your Queensland portfolio we see at the top of the page uh, that uh, given the bank's position in the agribusiness lending market relative to its competitors, further investigation is warranted regarding the key drivers of the rate and nature of growth within the Queensland portfolio. In particular, relative to its competitors, over that period of growth, the following points are highlighted. Rural Bank did not necessarily offer the best rates, Competition for loans was strong and Rural Bank did not have a premium brand or the sales capability to attract top-end producers on a consistent basis. Do you agree with those matters? I agree with the first two and we still do not offer the best rates because that's a race to the bottom. Uh, competition for loans was strong because everybody was in that market. However, I would disagree with the premium brand. There was a partnership between elders and rural bank and one of the benefits of that partnership was having a number of um, elders district banking managers located within community, connected to their community and knowledgeable about the producers in that region and their um, systems of production. So I don't believe it was not a premium brand because the value proposition of having a bank and a pastoral house 
partnering to support Australian agriculture, I feel, is actually a premium brand. But Mr Corollas did not? He did not. The Corollas report suggested that this aggressive growth in the Queensland portfolio was accompanied by widespread deficiencies in both loan origination and loan management practices and procedures. Do you agree with that? Uh, certainly in the loan management uh, practices, as we've talked about a little bit, um, there were certainly areas that of substantial improvement. In terms of loan origination, having looked at the 62 loans that became non-performing, um, origination uh, was appropriate, particularly in um, the earlier years and before they got into some challenging conditions from external factors. Well, that wasn't the view of Mr Corollas, was it? No. Um, Mr Corollas, in relation to loan origination, identified issues relating to a failure to properly assess loan serviceability? He did. And he said at 0014 that based on the problem accounts that Rural Bank had been managing, he considered the consistent theme to be a lack of debt serviceability. He did highlight that, and certainly looking at a number of those loans in the Queensland portfolio, when they are designed for a bridging purpose, <coughs> serviceability assessment is impractical and not appropriate because of the strategy to then um, pay down debt via asset sale. Mr Corollas found that a specific manifestation of this theme of lack of debt serviceability was the noticeable increase in uh, debt serviceability ratios in Queensland loans from 2004 to 2006. Correct, yes. And within those two years, he found that the proportion of loans with a debt service serviceability ratio of over 50% jumped from 13% to close to 24%. Yes. So that by 2006, the Queensland portfolio had almost double the national average of loans with a debt serviceability ratio of over 50%. Yes, that's stated in his report. So that indicated a much greater reliance on security than debt serviceability. Correct. Now, this was reinforced um, on page 0015 <coughs> by Mr Corollis's review of a number of performing and non-performing files from which he determined that debt serviceability requirements were either waived or heavily subordinated in terms of importance in favour of security coverage. Correct. In other words, he found that a customer's ability to repay their loan was subordinated to rural banks' ability to recoup the money via the sale of the security offered in connection with the loan. That's correct. And we see at 0015 that the human consequence of this was that for a number of files and in Mr Corollis's words, a significant sample of stressed accounts, a customer wasn't able to service their debt at the first review date. That's what's written here, yes. And Mr Corollis considered that those serviceability issues were masked by the structure of the interest repayments offered by the bank. That's what his view was, yes. Now, do you agree with those views, Ms Gardman? Um, no. Uh, well, the masking by the um, interest repayment structure I disagree with. Um, these are <laughs> half yearly interest payments and very appropriate for Queensland cattle given uh, the timing of their cash flow. And we still have about 30% um, of our loans in Queensland cattle are on half yearly um, interest repayment cycles. <coughs> What about Mr Corollis's finding about a significant sample of stressed accounts showing that the customer wasn't able to service the debt at the very first review date? Uh, that's his finding, yes. Do you have any reason to dispute that? Well, I haven't looked at I haven't looked at exactly the same set of files that he looked at. I no. looked at uh, 62 specifically. Yes. And um, from my view and from my investigations on those files, um, they were serviceable. Is there any reason why, Ms Gartman, when you annexed Mr Corollis's report to your statement, uh, you didn't mention the many 
issues that you have with the report, the areas of disagreement you have with the report? No. Do you understand that by annexing the report to your yes. statement and providing it as one of the aspects of the investigation that was conducted by Rural Bank, yeah. um, it's difficult for anyone to assess that you have any issues with the content of any of those no, reports? No, I think what I'm disagreeing with is some of the systemic nature. Yes. Um, certainly recognise that we did have an over-reliance on security yep. in Queensland and that uh, the emphasis and the balance between serviceability and security was not appropriately balanced. Um, there has subsequently been substantial work to address this, largely through training and oversight. So I'm not disagreeing with any of that. What I am disagreeing with is the systemic nature and uh, of these issues across Rural Bank. And I'm also disagreeing with some of the elements um, which Mr Carolla uh, points to as being inappropriate when I think from an agricultural context they are appropriate, such as the half yearly interest cycle. But so it, it's more in the severity um, and the, I don't believe it was a systemic issue. However, these reports are fact. Um, they were uh, tabled and, and discussed and therefore they did trigger um, a range of actions subsequent. Well, they triggered a range of actions because these were regarded by the bank to be systemic problems that required systemic change, weren't they? That is the view of the author, yes. No, I'm not talking about Mr Carolus. You've referred to the steps taken following Mr Carolus's report. You've referred earlier today to the Willis report, which set out a large number of recommendations to be made by the bank in relation to culture, in relation to governance, in relation to the handling of loans generally. They were systemic changes that needed to be made because these were systemic problems, were they not? No, they were not. In my view, sitting here in 2018 and reviewing these files and reading the minutes not as someone who was participating and looking particularly at the 62 Queensland cattle loans, um, I do not believe that they were systemic. So the bank was wrong to make the systemic changes in response to these matters? They did not make systemic uh, changes in to response. To culture, to governance? There were certainly work and effort, as they continue to be, um, on policies and procedures, cultural alignment, training and oversight that did take place. And they still take place. And it's not because we have a poor bank and poor practices. It's because there's continual improvement and it's always better ways of doing things. There were very significant changes that were made as a result of this report and the Willis report that followed it, weren't they? Um, I think there was a lot of refinement because when I look at the broader underwriting um, standards within the 2005 credit manual, and I've compared that to the 2013 credit policy uh, manual and the 2018 one that we operate under now, um, largely it's there. The changes that took place um, have largely been around articulation, greater guidance, greater clarity for each and every person within uh, the lending value chain to actually um, have greater direction on what they should be doing and doing what's right. So banking has it actually has a poor record for being clear and articulate and um, putting things into plain English. And much of what I've seen, the improvements in the policies and procedures, has been greater guidance. So the changes that were made, you described them in your statement as including rebalancing of rural banks' focus on loan serviceability, improvements in staff training, tightened performance management, changes in relation to valuations and appraisals, and implementing new governance practices, including significantly expanding the remit, responsibility and membership of the Management Credit Committee to monitor the credit risk profile of rural bank establishing the Lending Standards Review Committee to investigate potential lending policy breaches and establishing the Compliance and Conduct Standards Committee. Yes, correct. These are the changes that you referred to in your statement at paragraph 71 in response to Mr Carolus's report and the Willis report that followed. Correct. They were significant systemic changes. Um, I don't believe they were systemic. Oh, well, they were significant changes over a period of seven years and they were in response to the matters identified in Mr Carolus's report and the Willis report that followed. Uh, and the prior report, yes. 
KPMG. Yes, the KPMG report. report. Thank yes. you. Uh, so if I could just take you to a few other parts of the Corollis report, Ms Gartman. At 0019, we see that from Mr Corollis's review of a large number of poorly performing accounts, he identified 15 additional very troubling themes relating to loan origination and loan management more broadly. Do you see that? I do. And they included a strong bias toward asset lending on the assumption that rural property values would continue to increase and accordingly asset sales would provide a comfortable first way out in the event of recovery action. Yes. They included a failure to disclose, recognise and identify the true risk profile of the borrower. Yes. They included a compromised valuation process uh, with valuations having been instructed and or influenced by sales. Yes. They included appraisals being <coughs> inflated due to the appraiser not visiting and inspecting the property and or possibly compromised due to an inherent conflict of interest. Yes. They included cash flows for clients having been prepared by sales <coughs> and not cited or agreed with the borrower. Yes. They included an over-reliance and usage of temporary limits. Yes. Poorly structured credit approvals and waiving of conditions subsequent to approval. Yes. Lending against defective and poor securities. Yes. Obvious warning signs such as bank statement anomalies that were either not identified or overlooked. Yes. Permitting customer risk rating overrides without proper justification. Yes. And credit allowing perceived pressure from sales and or management to compromise the independence of credit decisions. Yes. Now these were themes uh, which had been a significantly material contributor to the credit issues which the bank found itself experiencing in 2011. Those were definitely the views of the author, yes. And these are systemic matters, not isolated matters? Um, yes, well, Mr Corollis highlights uh, in the first paragraph that they are not restricted to the Queensland portfolio. Mm. They were themes that impacted upon rural bank customers around Australia, weren't they? According to the author, yes. And we you see... Say according to the author. The author was the chief risk officer of the bank, is that right? That's correct, yes. Is there any reason you offer why I should not uh, uh, understand the chief risk officer of the bank to have made an accurate assessment? Um, I think when you uh, consider... If you asked the rural bank leadership team, uh, risk is one component and they will always uh, view things as a glass half full as opposed to the full executive uh, uh, leadership team. So in the, uh, with, with this particular report, uh, it was drawing attention, uh, strong attention to a number of issues, uh, but I don't know that that was the view of the entire leadership team. The risk officer doing his job, wasn't it? He was. We see in the final sentence on this page, Ms Gartman, Mr Corollis's um, conclusion, based on my review, a number of these issues were clearly systemic and not isolated and have been a significantly material contributor to the credit issues currently faced by the bank. Yes, that's written there. You disagree with that? I think <laughs> that's a common theme. Um, the issues were there and they triggered a number of actions uh, and improvements to systems process policy. Uh, in my view, sitting here in 2018 and, and reading the materials, it was not a systemic across the board issue. I well, can I understand better than I presently do what you mean by systemic in this context? So I believe that if it had been a broad systemic issue, we would have seen a lot more non-performing files. We would have seen further deterioration um, of the uh, credit profile of the bank and, and not just in Queensland. It would have been seen across the board. There were significant numbers of non-performing files, weren't there, Ms Gartman? Um, I know that uh, in Queensland there were, yes. Yes, and what about outside of Queensland? 
Um, <coughs> I don't have the numbers at hand unless you've got them. So you assume that there weren't? Well, having a look at the broader portfolio and also the portfolio performance in recent time, um, I cannot draw a conclusion that it was systemic at a national scale. Although Mr Carollas did. Yes. Now, uh, on 0020, we see that one of the final reflections by Mr Carollas was that a number of the loans should simply never have been approved. Do you see that in the second paragraph? Yes. Now, you didn't exhibit to your statement the minutes of the board credit committee meeting at which this report was presented. Uh, I don't think so. Why not, Ms Gartman? You exhibited many, many board credit committee meeting minutes. Why did you not exhibit the minutes that considered this report? I don't know, sorry. The committee had a significant discussion about what had emerged from Mr Carolus's report at that meeting. Yes, it did. And if we uh, go to BAB five doubles, I'm sorry, five triple zero six triple zero four double zero seven zero five double zero six. I'm sorry. Now, we need to turn within this document to the minutes of the 27th of July 2011 meeting, which are at 0074. And we see at the bottom of the page there that, amongst other things, so sorry, I should direct you first to the uh, paragraph above that, which shows that Mr. Carollas presented his paper at this meeting. Yes. And highlighted a number of matters in relation to that report. Yes. Uh, and then noted that the overarching control framework had proved deficient and significant changes have been made in this regard. Yes. And we see the chairman's response below that. Yes. The chairman noted that the current credit situation was unsatisfactory and that there appears to have been cultural issues contributing to the issues currently faced. Yes and that while in some circumstances uh, lending outside the bank's preferred underwriting standards may be permissible, the report suggested that basic credit disciplines appeared to have been ignored. Yes. And at 0075, We see that the chairman noted at the top of the page that a presentation was made approximately five years ago which highlighted that the value of Queensland cattle properties were heading into a pure asset bubble and these warnings appear to have been ignored. I tried to find that uh, particular presentation but I was unable to so I can only go on what's written there. And we see Mr Patton, a director, noting that growth appears to have been an issue given the rate of growth and the size of the deals being written. Yes. Now, uh, the tenor of these minutes, which I, I assume you've read in preparation for giving evidence today, Ms Gartman, the tenor of these minutes is that the issues which had been identified by Mr Carolus in his credit structure report <coughs> stemmed from the aggressive growth that had been pursued in the Queensland loan portfolio. Following the market trends, yes. Why is it important to you to add the qualification of following the market trends, Ms Well, Gartman? I think it was actually an industry-wide issue and... Um, what was an industry-wide issue? The growth in uh, activity in Queensland and the increased size of lending in Queensland cattle. Well, I, I don't understand why that makes it any better or any worse. It doesn't make it any better or any worse. I'm just um, making sure that uh, I'd like to highlight that we weren't um, above industry growth rates. We were in, tracking in line and we were following the crowd, unfortunately. So you accept that there was uh, aggressive growth that was pursued by the bank in the Queensland portfolio at this time? Yes. And we see that uh, 
after a further discussion of the findings of the report on page 0075, um, including uh, highlighting of the need for greater cultural alignment between sales and credit, the chairman notes towards the bottom of that page that the bank must take responsibility for resolving these issues and the focus needs to be on making permanent improvements to all facets of the credit process, including the oversight function. Yes. That was the position of the chairman taken following the presentation of Mr Corollis's report. Correct. I tender that document, Commissioner. It, it, the, the minutes are within a, a larger document, Commissioner, which is the Board Credit Committee meeting pack for a meeting on the 17th of August 2011. Board Credit Committee meeting pack, what date, Ms Orr? 17 August 2011. 17 August 2011, BAB 5006 0004 0070. Exhibit 4.128. So after the presentation of Mr Corollis's report, the bank took significant steps to improve its policies and procedures. You accept that? Yes. Uh, and they related to loan serviceability, securities, valuations and loan monitoring. Correct, yes. And the first step in that process was obtaining a further external report, which you've referred to as the Willis Report, and which is annexed to your statement. Actually, the first step was at that July meeting forming a task force uh, to investigate, and then they uh, engaged a consultant. And was that the consultant who produced the report you've been referring to as the Willis Report? And that was provided in November 2011? It was. And many of the findings in that report are consistent with action items that had been identified by APRA as early as 2006? Yes, correct. So the key messages in the Willis Report related to credit culture, yes. governance, approval processes and portfolio management and monitoring. Yes, correct. Rural Bank then took steps to implement recommendations made in the Willis Report? Yes. And the work project that followed took a number of years? Yes. And your statement charts developments up until April 2013? Yes. But further policy changes were necessary even after that period? Well, in light, in view of the continuous improvement program, yes, they weren't necessarily um, in response to the Willis report. Um, there were there are always policy reviews and further developments. So, for example, in March 2012, APRA was still expressing the view that rural banks' number of outstanding reviews was far too high. Um, if that, if you say so, yes, I'm. I'm can't happy quite to remember. show you that document if you're not familiar with that one, uh, Ms. Yes. Gartman. That's BAB 5032003027800. So this is uh, a letter from APRA on the 14th of March 2012 and if I could direct your attention to 0281. Yes, yeah, so this was only a few months after the Willis report had been tabled which identified similar issues. Yes. And there were a number of work streams underway. Yes, so at this time in March 2012 we see from the middle of the page that APRA still thought that the bank's annual reviews were far too high and that the whole process should be re-evaluated. Yes. Particularly when it would appear that some large loans can go three years without a review. Yes. So that remained a problem in 2012. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Letter APRA to Rural Bank, 14 March 2012, BAB 5032003027, Exhibit 4.129. Now, if we take the date of late 2011 as the time by which the critical issues were identified, that's the date that you assign in your statement, we can see that it took about a year and a half or more uh, to complete the first tranche of reforms. Yes. Uh, do you consider that was an appropriate length of time? Well, one of the primary first steps was uh, reviewing and uh considering changes to the risk appetite statement uh, because from that flows the framework for credit assessment. 
So that was a piece of work that took a, took a substantial amount of time and went back and forwards to the board and board credit committee for a period of time. So it did unfortunately take that long, yes. The work project that you describe in your statement focused almost entirely on revisions and amendments to your policies and procedures, is that right? Uh, along with uh, training uh, and oversight, yes. There's no reference in your statement to any work relating to customer remediation? No. And you tell us that the only investigations that Rural Bank undertook in respect of the systemic issues that were identified in relation to origination and management were investigations that were undertaken in a general fashion rather than in respect of individual customers? Well, for many of uh, the customers in the Queensland cattle portfolio uh, that had become non-performing, we were having direct um, and very close relationships uh, with them as we were working through. So um, aside from that, uh, there was no communication around um, any of the issues that were highlighted in the Willis report because most of those were internal and pertain to the amounts of funds that the bank was writing off, not that customers were writing off. Well, the two are not mutually exclusive, are they, Ms Gartman? There were serviceability issues with the capacity to affect the customers individually. Correct. And were the customers told about that? No. Should they have been told about that? Well, I don't believe that serviceability alone was, or, or um, lack of appropriate serviceability assessment was the driving factor behind those loans becoming non-performing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've conceded in your statement that the conduct of Rural Bank contributed to those loans becoming non-performing. Correct. So we. Um, had not adequately um, assessed to leave sufficient resilience to weather a perfect storm of live export um, ban impacting markets for a substantive period of time and a five-year drought. So do I understand that no rural bank clients whose loans were examined uh, as part of the work that was done on these issues were informed of any issues that had been discovered in respect of their loans? No. I'm correct that that did not happen? I don't believe so. Okay, and should it have happened? As I said, because I don't believe that the serviceability assessment was causal, um, no. I don't believe it would follow through that we would inform customers of that. And there was no remediation program set up? apart from working directly with the customers uh, to get through a challenging external environment? No. Now, if similar issues, which I want to describe as systemic issues, but I take it that you'll cavil with that descri description, but if similar issues were identified by Rural Bank today, would Rural Bank respond in the same way as it did then? It really does depend on the circumstance in terms of um, if they are average seasons and we had this response um, of a, a credit portfolio quality downgrade, then yes. If it's due to external circumstances that are beyond reasonable, then no. I, I just want to make sure that in answering my question, Ms Gartman, you are taking into account <coughs> the matters that were not external that contributed to the performance of these loans, including the 15 themes identified by Mr Carolus in relation to his assessment of the portfolio. So when I've looked at the 62 loans, um, as I said, there are a very small number that I don't believe we would write today. Um, and so therefore, um, writing them uh, <coughs> and their performance, uh, I don't believe is impacted by the assessment that we undertook. So today, if you identified a failure to disclose, recognise and identify the true risk profile of the borrower, would you tell the borrower that you had identified that? So if we were doing that today with no external conditions um, that were 
the perfect storm, then yes. Well, why, why does the presence of the external conditions um, impact on whether or not you should disclose to a customer that there has been a failure to disclose, recognise and identify their risk profile? So if the risk profile is impacted by those extreme external events, it's not because of the serviceability or credit assessment that um, they're in financial difficulty. Because I don't believe, if we truly considered the risk profile of Australian agriculture and factored in what, you know, millennial droughts, um, a political decision on markets, then no one would lend in Australian agriculture. It is the only, um, Australia is the only country that has not got, uh, that does not have any subsidised support for farmers to um, buffer them against many of these externalities. And I feel, it is my belief, that um, that volatility needs to be considered, but you cannot um, sensitise and consider a credit assessment for that perfect storm, otherwise you would never lend in Australian agriculture and then you are financially excluding a large part of our community. Yes, uh, in answering my questions, I understand you to keep coming back to the external factors that were present in these loans. I'm asking you to put the external factors to one side. If you identified today that one of your staff had failed to disclose, recognise and identify the true risk profile of the borrower in making an assessment of a loan to that borrower, would you tell the borrower that that had occurred? We would, yes. Thank you. And if you identified today that a valuation process in connection with a loan had been compromised, yes. would you tell the borrower that that had occurred? Yes, and we have. And you have? Yes. That has some, that's something that's occurred recently? Uh, no, it's uh, through the course of these activities. So you have spoken to customers about these matters? Um, we have spoken to customers um, about a number of these issues. Like I said, through discussions, through our asset management, we have had those conversations. So you've spoken to customers about valuations that were compromised? Uh, not in the Queensland cattle industry, no. And there have been other valuations that have been compromised? Uh, we have had one instance, yes. And you disclosed that instance to the customer? Yes. Uh, and where you became aware that um, credit risk rating overrides had been implemented without proper justification, would you draw that to the attention of the borrower? No. And why not? Because that is largely a, an internal um, rating and I don't know that um, customers uh, would take well to being informed that they are maybe on a watch list. It's not conducive to the relationship and it largely impacts the oversight that we have on that particular loan. And where you became aware that the independence of credit decisions had been compromised because of pressure from sales or management, would you draw that to the attention of the borrower? Uh, it depends if there is impact on the customer, then yes. Largely, uh, they would be the risk being carried by the bank. Thank you, Ms Gartman. I have no further questions. Yes, Mr. Pratt. <coughs> One matter, Commissioner. Ms. Gartman, just a few minutes ago, you were asked a question by Ms. Orr. This is transcript 3685, line 1, Commissioner. You were asked a question about the contents of your witness statement. The question was you have conceded in your witness statement that the conduct of rural bank contributed to those loans becoming non performing. And you said in answer to that question about the contents of your witness statement, correct. Could you please take out your witness statement, Ms Gartman, and go to paragraph 60 on page 13, which reads, I do consider that the issues referred to at paragraph 54 above may have meant that some of the loans were more susceptible to the cumulative effect of external stresses than they otherwise would have been. Is that the part of your witness statement that you had in mind when you answered correct to Ms Orr's question? Yes, it is. No further questions, Commissioner. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Ms Gartman. You may step down or excused. Commissioner, if I might just uh, deal with one documentary aspect. I've discussed it with Ms Orr. This relates to the tender of a small number of documents which uh, are, if I can uh, encapsulate them, the responses of Rural Bank to the APRA letters that were tendered by Ms Orr, 
we seek to tender the banks of responses to those letters from APRA to the bank, and I understand there's no opposition to that. If I could give uh, the Commissioner the references, we'd seek to tender the five documents. Yes. The first is BAB 5034-0001-0001, dated 24 August 2009, uh, Rural Bank's response to the APRA Prudential Review Report, dated 1 July 2009. We tender that. That document is Exhibit 4.130. Commissioner, please. The next is BAB 5024-0001-1713, dated 14 February 2011, entitled Rural Bank's Response to the APRA Prudential Review Report, dated 7 January 2011. Tend to that. That is Exhibit 4.131. And then, Commissioner, the other two documents, I may have said five a minute ago, I think I meant four. Uh, the other two documents are both responsive to what was Exhibit 4.129. Uh, one is a letter and one is an attachment to the letter. The first... Do it as a single document, uh, single exhibit, I think, Mr Batt. Uh, thank, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, they do have different dates and document references, but that's, that's no difficulty, I'll just note that. The first document reference is BAB 5032, Triple zero three zero two seven seven, dated 26 April 2012, and entitled Rural Bank's Response to the APRA Prudential Review Report, dated 14 March 2012. And going with it, uh, on that, that basis, Commissioner, is BAB 5006-0014-0060, dated 24 April 2012, entitled APRA Prudential Review Action Plan. We'd tender those two documents as one if we might. Together those will be Exhibit 4.132. Thank you, Mr Batt. Commissioner Plazes. Commissioner, that was the last case study in the agricultural finance part of this hearing block. Um, before we move to the next topic in the hearing block, could I tender four statements obtained from CBA witnesses which will not be the subject of cross-examination. They are a statement from Mr Grant Cairns, C-A-I-R-N-S, dated the 19th of June 2018. Comes exhibit 4.133. A statement from Mr Mark Wasak, W-L-O-S-S-A-K, dated the 19th of June 2018. Comes exhibit 4.134. A statement from Joanna White, J-O-H-A-N-N-A, -N dated the 21st of June 2018. Comes Exhibit 4.135. And a second statement from Ms White, dated the 29th of June 2018. Sorry, what date? The 29th. Thank you. Becomes Exhibit 4.136. Perhaps if the Commission would allow a short break uh, to allow Rural Bank's representatives uh, to leave and then I will deliver an opening statement in That's relation to the very welcoming to you, Mr Batt. Uh, I won't comment on whether we'd rather stay or go, but I will go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I come back at five past three, Ms Orr. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, Jack, I 